Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I've done this way too many times already, so I'm just going to read it straight from the note card. So, do you need a bit of money to buy your car, pay off credit card debt, student loans, or even pay for a mahar, but don't have the money just yet? It would be so helpful if someone could pay you between $5,000 to $50,000. Trouble is, modern lending involves haram riba. To make the lives of Muslims easier, Fund Me BFF has launched a brand new financial product that bypasses riba. I'll quickly tell you how it works. You get a sum of money and you pay back a certain percentage of your income every month. If your income goes up, you pay more. If your income goes down, you pay less. It's that simple. If you live in the USA, have a stable source of income, have a good credit score, or pay your bills on time, and want to avoid riba, then check out the description box to learn more about halal financing from fundmebff.com. Now back to the show. What's good? Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Today, we have a younger guest, probably our youngest guest ever. Some of you might know him as Fahim, while others might have heard of his other name or his brand, Mr. Focus 180. So Fahim, welcome to the show. Shout out, Mr. Focus 180. Hopefully, hopefully more people know me by Fahim, but if they don't, then that's okay. Mr. Focus 180 it is. Jazakallah khair, gentlemen, I appreciate the invitation. I think you guys are doing some fantastic work. I, I think that the, the, the thing that got me uh, to connect more recently was seeing Daniel's post where you guys were mentioned, you know, where he was sharing that podcast. Yeah, it's good. Alhamdulillah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, without further ado, uh, I guess for the, for our audience, I mean, I, even I, I didn't know much about you until, I mean, I heard about you from a couple of people on Twitter. I saw your Instagram and stuff, but mm. you know, you know, who are you? And like, well, what is your mission? Alhamdulillah, man. I am Fahim Farouk, as uh, you've introduced me. I'm a student of clinical psychology currently. And I'm also the founder and CEO of Focus 180. That's Focus-180. And I'm, I'm, I'm just a brother. You know, I'm just a brother and a young man who is really committed to this renaissance of, of masculinity within the context of Islam in this modern 21st century age, you know, where we're, we're just riddled with the breakdown of many structures and different traditions, whether it's Western traditions and even... Eastern traditions, and in the in the in the in the aftermath of all this, there's a lot of confusion and chaos, right? Not just non-Muslims, but Muslims as well, because our situation is unique in the sense that we've been we've been colonized for the last hundred years. We haven't had a a, a khilafah, right? So I grew up in Canada, <clears throat> not knowing a lot of this stuff, and like most kids, my uh, who have a similar demographic as me, a similar background as me, I, I grew up thinking. Oh, I must be alone in this. You know, I, I grew up mainly around a majority uh, white middle class population. Um, and when, when we first moved to Canada, because originally I'm from Boston, Massachusetts, when you first moved to Canada, we moved up to a city called Barrie, Barrie, Ontario. This was probably 1995. And back then, subhanAllah, man, they didn't even know, they didn't even know what a proper beard looked like. That's how white they were. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they had a single halal uh, meat store in Barry at that time. My uncle, who's my, my mom's oldest first cousin, he was uh, in Barry before us. He was probably one of the first Muslim uh, families that came to this area as a professional. He's a psychiatrist, um, got his training in India. Then he went to the United Kingdom, got further training. He opened a practice in Barry. So he was kind of the, the hub around whom all the other Muslims networked. And he, he opened the first masjid in Barrie, which is still, alhamdulillah, uh, functioning to this day. I grew up amongst these white kids, middle class, and in Barrie, a lot of them were, were rural kids too. So my perception is you know, being influenced very noticeably as, as me being a minority, that one brown kid. And any other brown kids are most likely not even Muslim, they're like Hindus, right? And so, I'm, I'm struggling to understand who am I, just like any other kid from my background is going to ask those questions. Who am I? Um, how do I reconcile being a minority Muslim male in this environment? At that point, it wasn't as bad as it is today in terms of the uh, sort of emasculation going on in school. It was still there for sure, but it wasn't as bad in the sense that kids my age were still, you know, guys my age were still pushed into 
competitive team sports. That culture still existed, right? In the 90s. Um, the, the idea of uh, make, you know, paving your own path. <coughs> paving your own path and making a name for yourself as, a, as, a, as an individual, part of a team was also present in the culture. So this idea of, you know, just getting participation medals just for showing up didn't exist. And, it, and what that forced you to do was it forced you to actually show up or completely hide two different extremes. Either you show up or you hide. I grew up under this and with the additional pressure of being the only minority Muslim kid. And as I grew up and I grew older, I would travel back and forth to Boston, Massachusetts, where I was from originally. My cousins still live there. They actually lived in front of uh, Malcolm X, alayhi rahma's house, the, the, one of his old houses. It's right beside a park called Malcolm X Park. A lot of history there. So when I went there, it, it was a different vibe because I'm like, you know, like the, 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 this is my route, right? These are my roots. And this area is, is filled with challenges, you know, that a lot of the kids that I see around in school, a lot of these middle-class white kids, they themselves have never tasted. And at this time I, in school, I was kind of feeling inferior to many of them because I'm like, I, I stand out. My culture is different. Uh, at home, what I'm receiving, the programming I'm receiving is very different from the programming they're receiving at home versus you know, how easily they can accept the dominant culture at school. So I'm feeling a little inferior, <clears throat> even though I was going through more hardships in terms of economic struggles, in terms of identity formation than a lot of these kids, things that would actually make you harder. You know what I mean? Things that would, that would give you confidence if you understood the value of it. So when I went back to Boston and I saw what's happening to other, other minority groups in areas that were rough, I was like, that's interesting. You know, that's very inter it's very interesting that this is where I'm from and I've, 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 I've experienced these streets because sometimes when I would go back, I would spend extended periods of time in Boston. I'd kind of go back and forth. And then when I return, all of a sudden, I, would, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't integrate those experiences and realize that, wait, I should, I should be more proactive in developing my identity and, 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 and giving value to people around me instead of seeking approvals constantly. So all these different experiences, it, they, they opened my eyes to a very fundamental reality, which is you need to know yourself. You need to know who you are. You need to know where you came from. Because if you don't, then what's going to happen to you is you're going to remain a passive, indifferent blob you know you're going to be absorbed into whatever pressures are, are around you you're not going to be a trendsetter you're also not going to be a critical thinker your your decisions won't be principled right based on sound thinking a a clear framework that determines what is right what is wrong peer pressure is going to swallow you up and mm -hmm. you're going to and, and you're going to you're going to be doing a disservice to yourself because if you just took a look at who you are you would find many reasons to actually stick it out and, and be confident. All of these experiences, including some terrible losses, like my, one, of, one of my good friends um, being stabbed to death in a gang-related incident when I was in high school, <clears throat> me, me being pulled into some situations I never imagined I would be in, involved in, you know, because in high school, I went to a pretty rough school in downtown in my city. It's like day and night. You have this program, they're called the IB program. It's the International Baccalaureate program. It's like an yeah. enriched program. We had yeah, that and then you well. have, sorry? I actually grew up through that as well. Say that again? You know, actually, you know about it. Yeah, I yeah, grew up through The same it. program, yeah. Oh, yeah, you went to it, huh? Yeah. Yeah. That's so cool. Okay, go on. So it's like the same school has the IB program, but it also has all these ghetto kids. You know, it's really <laughs> interesting. Like they, they kind of like mix. Yeah, you know? And all the other schools, they're just like suburban white schools, middle class white kids few Catholic schools, preppy kids. And I'm like, this is very strange, but that crowd involved a lot of polarity. You had some really cool kids and you had some kids who were struggling. So naturally there was conflict. My friend got involved. Um, How old uh, were you? Uh, in, in, like, in, interject. Is this like, again? what Like what time was this in your, uh, in school? Was this like middle school, high school, 15? How old were you? <clears throat> this was when I was 14. So this was in high school. Okay, 14. So you're 14, your friend's getting I was involved in something. 
yeah, you know, I, I had friends getting involved in in the wrong crowds. Now, mm -hmm. um, Were you like the only uh, I myself. Country? At this high school, no. Fortunately, at this high school, this high school was a game changer in that this high school was the first place I went where I saw diversity in terms of representation of Muslims, uh, even other non-Muslims, but from different backgrounds. Through, from, mm. from primary school through middle school or junior high, I was like one of the few brown Muslim kids, you know, like the few. And even if there was another Muslim, chances are they would probably be like Shia or if there was another brown kid, they would be Hindu. So, yeah, we're minorities, but to find the exact same kind of minority group in one place was very, very rare. So, <clears throat> I go to this high school. I felt at home. I felt, you know, I felt like, wow, I can finally, I, I can finally connect with people who understand the experiences I went through growing up, and even the non-Muslims that went there because they're in, they're in the IB program, they're they're more. Uh, intelligent they're critical thinkers you know they're, they won't just like in lunchtime during lunchtime they won't just sit around smoke weed and talk about just stupid tv shows like jersey jersey shore or whatever they were watching i don't even think that was out back then it was probably something else <laughs> so these hardships uh, like the loss of my friend getting into into violence being pulled into uh the the roughness of the, that that the street life brings they they they, they kind of force me to confront the bubble that my parents were trying to keep me in, you know, just like most immigrant parents go through hardship. They want to kind of keep their kids insulated from that. I noticed that I was being kept in a bubble, <clears throat> oblivious to the actual hardships right around me because where we moved, when we transferred from that first city I mentioned called Barry to where I am now, we moved to an area that wasn't the greatest. My dad, <coughs> mashallah, was a big chief engineer back in uh, Bangladesh and he did his master's in the US but at the time the job market was really rough in Canada so for him to land this particular job here it was a big deal and he took it even though that the, the area it would require us to move to wasn't the 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 safest or, or you know the most posh but it's like whatever we, you do what you got to do and he did it and yet the way they raised us kind of kept us at least mentally insulated from the fact that right outside our house, we have this trailer trash culture, you know, this, this skinhead culture, um, really, really old apartment buildings that are like covered in graffiti with uh, the cement chipping away, neighbors that are old white folk, good people, some of them, no doubt hardworking, good blue collar people, but others, you know, involved in all kinds of weird stuff, gang related activity, um, shady dealing who knows right i was insulated from that <coughs> at least mentally but in high school i had to confront it i had to confront it and i had to start coming to terms with the fact that this is around me all the while i'm going through the spiritual crisis because now i'm starting to ask the questions i'm asking i'm asking the questions of why do i do what i do abstain from alcohol avoid premarital relationships abstain from drug use you know these are the typical questions that are coming up now then they got they got deeper and deeper and deeper because around the same time i'm i'm confronted with uh people who have other beliefs christians challenging my beliefs as a muslim um atheists challenging my beliefs as a theistic muslim and i'm thinking to myself that this is really interesting i'm at this intersection where i'm going through this spiritual crisis i'm going through this identity crisis I'm going through um, a crisis of security, right? Safety, security. I'm trying to figure, I'm trying to discover my masculinity. What, what does it mean to be, you know, cool at that age? That's how you interpret it. You're not really thinking, what does it mean to be a man? You're thinking, what does it mean to be cool, socially mm -hmm. respected, right? That's the way I interpret it. So I'm, I'm thinking to myself, like, I'm going through all this crazy stuff. I have no one to reach out to. I have no one to reach out to. My parents, mashallah, they're working hard, but they're out of touch with these realities or they're not talking to me about them. It's one of the, one of, one of the two, mm -hmm. they, they, they would have given me standard advice. Like we don't date, just tell people, tell the girls we don't date. I'm like, okay. I'm like, what else? And like, they didn't I'm, tell you the why. Right? Yeah. They didn't tell me the why, like it's like, or, or if they did, it was like a standard, you know, that's not part of who we are. It's not part of yeah, it wasn't like, 
I'm in like, depth. Nothing in like, depth. No, like nothing with wisdom. <clears throat> nothing with wisdom. Yeah. Um, yeah. So then you were you were like in high school, right? When you were confronting these things. I'm, I'm, I'm in high school confronting these things, and and keep in mind back then. Even the Facebook world was very different. We didn't have, you know, how like there's Muslim Twitter now and then Muslim Facebook. That wasn't yeah. there. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, so even even if you wanted to network with people online, very hard. I think back then you had all these weird underground forums, like Salafi forums and Sufi forums and different kinds of forums. That's yeah. the only place you could actually find like-minded people. Like when I speak to some of the older Da'is, that's where they were. All, they were all hiding there. They were all, all, they were all chilling over there. Not on Facebook. Of the internet. And so it's like. You're, if you're if you're going through this stuff, you you have literally your local imam, your parents, and if you're lucky, a handful of friends. If you're lucky, if you're fortunate, and in my case, I was that one friend that my other friends would try to ask these questions to, and I'm like, Subhanallah, <laughs> what about me? Like, where do I go? So, so where did you go? What Focus did you do? 180 represented for me the culmination of a coming of age journey as a young Muslim man, you know, and all the stuff I had to figure out the trial and error I had to go through the painful losses I had to endure my friend getting stabbed, another friend dying in a car crash, me myself getting pulled into difficult uh, confrontations in the street, whether it was through um, racism or just being in the wrong place at the wrong time or Having group, uh, having having a friend circle that I wanted to protect from other people who wrongly judged them, all these things, plus the fact that I was going through this terrible, terrible crisis of iman, and not knowing how to think clearly, not having someone to teach me the tools of logic and reasoning, to to be able to form the right judgments in the face of this utter confusion. Focus 180 was the byproduct of all of these experiences because I was thinking to myself that I don't want any of these new kids, these new young boys to have to be alone in this when it was, it was hell. Like the fitting was real. The fitting was terrible. Um, You know, the fitting is so bad that it's even worse when, when, when the older generation doesn't understand it, they can't see it, even though it's right in front of you. Right. So it's like, not only do you have to experience it, you often have to face people denying that you're experiencing it, which makes it that time that much worse. You know, it's like at the least you would want someone to empathize. Like, look, I understand things are rough. Here's a map. That's the best case scenario. Here's a map. Okay. If you can't do that, at least, at least acknowledge that. Yeah, this is, this is a rough situation. But what I noticed was for a lot of guys like me, it wasn't even that it was like denial, just denial of the fact that this is what's going on. People are going astray you yourself are feeling dominated by the culture around you, not knowing how to competently navigate through it. Um, <clears throat> not knowing how to integrate how you're, you're raised in a sort of traditional conservative culture with the culture around you. And then not, not having any immediate mentors around you. And if you, if there are any, they just reflect all the bad programming, you know, they became for lack of a better word, blue pilled, Right. So that's all you have. You got these Mm -hmm. so-called blue pilled mentors who are, who are around you. And I I like to say emasculated instead, because it's, it's just so much more specific. Right. Yeah. Specific. And then sounds like it makes more sense too. Yeah. It's It's more specific and it's just more, it's easier to measure that. So it's like, I see what happened to them where it's like, they didn't have a focus 180 type of platform. And they also, at that time, I don't think there was even, much of a widely spread sort of self-improvement circle, right? No, definitely. Yeah. That's, it's, yeah. that's a definitely like pretty recent, pretty recent. Yeah. Relatively speaking, pretty recent. So it's like they're getting the programming from their fathers who are often men Who's from, there? you know, Desi culture. <laughs> they might have some, you know, a mix of functional and dysfunctional parenting strategies that produce a person who's emasculated. Cause the dad is like trying to, he's, he's not just being a dominant figure in the family in the, in the sense of being, uh, a responsible steward who has authority. Right. What he's ending up doing is he's, he's, he himself probably feels, you know, overcome by being a minority who has, who's having to raise a family in this unknown land. He himself probably isn't feeling fully confident. He's stressed out. He's probably been raised in ways that may not be uh, entirely functional. And then 
maybe out of paranoia, maybe out of fear, he's, he's, create, he's raising his, his sons in the same way, like coddling them or suppressing them. You know, it's like an yeah. overly, overly bearing father figure. Yeah, yeah. to interject uh, on that point that you just made, uh, it's kind of like this. I see it too, right? You see like, you see it like, you know, immigrants in America, Muslims, the, the kids born and raised here, yet he still acts, he'll act like a, he'll act like a second class citizen. You yeah. know what I mean? That's it. Like, that's it. Yeah. Like, yeah. Things like things like the the Second Amendment, <clears throat> right? Like you'd be like, oh no, you know, what if you get, or, or even like just speech, right? They're afraid to say things. Even they're afraid though, like, to say things. That's it. They're afraid to say things, and they act emasculated. And then on the flip side, you will find there are some fathers that are very like I think, and it's usually rare. They, they either have to be very very religious, where like you know, you know, they won't shake a woman's hand, right? They'll set that example, yeah. right? Like yeah. like it happened to my dad once. Like we were in Arkansas, <clears> and, like. One of the teachers, she was a woman, she tried to shake my dad's hand, and, you know, he didn't shake her hand. Because uh, I lived in Arkansas. It was also a bit racist, too. Someone called my dad, like, Bin Laden and stuff like that. Whoa! Uh, so, yeah, <laughs> it, it was, that, it was there just, like, before we went to Saudi. But anyways, like, I always saw my That's, dad. That sounds, like, straight out of, a, out of a comic book, but it's, like, it yeah, really yeah. happens. That's jokes. Exactly. <laughs> and, like, but those, what you said is so true, because I don't think many people would, like, for example, my dad had a beard, right? Mm-hmm. Most, most people wouldn't have a beard. They'd be like... Oh no, you're not gonna get a job. Like, oh, shave your beard. Like, you know what I mean? Like, there's that. Uh, yeah, it's this. Yeah. It's this it's inferiority attitude. complex. Exactly, inferiority yeah. complex, right? Or like shaking yeah. hands, right? Oh, yeah. bro, just sh- like something that, like, oh, you won't get a job, blah blah blah. But you know, that's like, right. Kind of had that example. But th- again, that was I was fortunate to have that. Most mm-hmm. most people I knew weren't like that. Most people were, were 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 different. And I think, like you said, you kind of just give in to the cultural programming. Like, you just end up being Blue a belt. cultural Muslim, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like, do you smoke? Like, you'll just start smoking. You'll start dating. You know, <coughs> right? What do they say? First, it's uh, first it's language, then it's religion, then it's culture. First it's culture, then it's language, yeah. then it's religion. And by third generation, you're gone. Right? You're gone. You're gone. And you see that with like uh, Muslims of Turkish descent, Muslims of Lebanese descent, even some Muslims of Pakistani descent, Indian descent. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's absolutely. Getting, it's getting common. Like, it's it's that it's the whole colonization process, right yeah. at work, right again. You know, it's like you're you're you have this colonized mentality. Uh, you don't, it's the lack of knowing how to do frame control, really, right? Yeah. That's what it is. Like, you've been colonized so much that you don't have frame control anymore. Your frame is now bored by the... Whatever they, whatever they define it as? Colonizer, yeah. Yeah. So then how whatever did you, okay, as. like you said you were dealing with all these things. At what point, like how old were you when you decided, like, okay, Islam is the way, I, I know this is the truth, and I, I need to get mm. my, I need to, you know, I need to live out, I need to define myself, my values. I need to live those values out. At what point did that come for you? So this was probably, I mean, it's, it was never a single point. It was like a, a long journey. And there was, there was a spectrum, a spectrum with different phases in that, in it. Right. So for example, mm-hmm. when I was, um, <clears throat> when I was 11, I first became, alhamdulillah, introspective enough to start writing. And I, I wrote so much that, my teacher, my, my uncle, the, the psychiatrist who, has, who is also a published author, mashaAllah, and my father, all three of them, they said, look, why don't you, why don't you publish these stories? And I'm like, I'm a kid. I'm like, publish, publish stories? Like, whoa, that's, that's out there for me. Especially because my programming at that point was like this. At home, I'm super hyper. Middle child, rebel, extrovert, fiery temperament. It's at school, I've been told, nope sit down, be quiet. Like my parents are telling me this, right? Listen to your elders, obey your authorities. And that transferred over to me acting that way with all the white kids, especially the girls. Right. I'm like, uh, <clears throat> so I'm, <laughs> quiet. I'm like, Oh my gosh, well, I, know, I, can't, I said he got a line. I'm this, I'm the only Brown kid. Oh man. What am I going to, you know, what if I get judged? So it's like, it's like, it's like that emasculating feeling times two, because now there's also that colonial factor, that colonized factor. Okay. It's like, one on top of the other. Yeah. I think so you, I would write a lot in that time because instead of expressing myself outwardly, I'm like, let me just put it all down on paper. I published that book, Alhamdulillah, by being pushed. My dad went back to Bangladesh and he, he had some uh, colleagues who were in the publishing industry there. They really liked it, Alhamdulillah, and, they, and so they decided to publish it. This phase was instrumental because it, it was the phase that started my journey of thinking and, and reflecting. That house that I lived in here, when my father took that first new engineering position in, in the face of a you know, difficult economy, that house, while it was in a, in a rough area, one of the blessings was that the surroundings were ve- very beautiful. Instead of being in one of those posh suburban 
you know, mainly middle class white neighborhoods, it was beside this large forest. And every morning, I remember like for during Fudger time, Subhanallah, like these deers would come out onto our front lawn. And we're just like, I, I could just see them. And I'm like, other kids didn't really get those experiences where they can see these signs, the signs of the creation. So grade, grade seven, I'm starting to think about these things more. Late at night, <clears throat> I somehow, you know, do you remember those, those videos where it's like those really, really cheap and really poorly thought out videos uh, attempts by Muslims to try to fool Mus other Muslims into believing like, oh, the name of Allah found on the moon. Miracle. Oh, yeah, yeah. That is weird. The real <laughs> It's like it's like on a mountain. Like if you yeah. look at it at a specific angle and you try really hard, you can kind of sort of see like an elephant and Allah. Or like <laughs> how Allah's name is in like fruits. Or yeah, Allah's name in fruits. Yeah. Or like it's in the cloud or like in the tree. In the tree or the cloud, you know? And I'm just like I'm just like watching these videos. I'm like, wow, like <laughs> it's, like, it's like Allah like <laughs> and I'm like, but then I'm I I'm reading the comments on YouTube and I'm like Oh, there's arguments going on. How do I respond to that? Or oh, what about this? What about that? And and at that point, you, you don't even know the rules of thinking, logical thought, right? So you're just like, w depending on how well you can think is how well you're going to go in and survive versus be completely confused. And the more I'm looking on Google, because of this dynamic of me being shy in public and needing needing to find this world where I can find security, the more I'm I'm finding myself discovering um, this world on the internet of interfaith dialogue. There was a site called Answering Christianity. Yeah, I know that one. Back in the days. I think one of the brothers, he's, I'm, I'm, I'm connected with him on Facebook. You guys know Bassam Zawadi? Yeah, 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 I know him. Yeah, yeah. So he was one of the contributors. And there was a few others. And I'll be, I'll be reading that so passionately because at school, um, there, there was this new minority kid from Africa. He was from, I believe, Nigeria. He just recently moved here. And I'm like, yo, we got some similar tradition in, in common in the sense that he, he understood the idea of tradition, you know, traditional family structures that involved sort of Christian influences, which was, which was remotely similar to what, we, what, I, what I experienced coming from a Muslim background, similar enough that we connected. And he had, he had Christian values. So again, we're connecting, but he starts asking me questions about why don't I believe in Jesus? So I'm like, uh -oh. man, I don't know. I, I'm going to have to research this stuff now. Wait, I remember so, one night, well, it's like 3 a.m., I'm on my computer in my room, and it's a school night. My dad comes into the room. I quickly turn my computer off, and I'm like, God knows what he thinks I'm watching. But I just, <laughs> it. my dad's like, what are you watching? Turn it on, turn it on. I'm like... <laughs> Jesus is the Lord. <laughs> I'm, <just> like, <laughs> I'm like, I'm like pretending to like forget the link because it was an article to um, answering why, you know, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa married Sayyidina Aisha radila anha at a young age. Yeah. And I'm, oh, okay. had words like sex in it or like pedophile, astaghfirullah. But I'm like, at that age, you're like, oh, our parents, if they see us reading stuff with these words, they're going to be so angry. So I'm like, oh, he can't know that I'm reading this stuff. But I don't know what he thought I was watching. You know, he's like concerned. Yeah, so what'd you do? So I eventually told him, no, I was just, uh, I, was, I was looking at like religion. And he's, now he's even more, more scared. <laughs> like, what? You're, you're, you're reading about religion? Because at that time, it's like post 9-11, right? Just f uh, four or five years after 9-11. So at this age, <clears throat> How old are you? I'm getting deeper nice. and deeper into studying religion. High school comes around. By that point, I'm a little bit more well versed because I've spent like all of Wait. grade eight now. No, hold on, hold on. Uh, uh, yeah. So was your you said you lived in a middle class white neighborhood, but they weren't very Christian. Can you repeat that? Like you said, most of the de the demographic was like blue collar white <clears throat> people, but they weren't. Were they Christian? Like. So the people that lived right around me, they were. But the people I went to school with, it was a mix of like middle class white kids and also some 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 white kids from blue collar families. And they, 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 generally speaking, were Christian, but they weren't very religious. It was just kind of an irrelevant secular phenomenon, you know? It's like, oh, okay, yeah, we're right. Christian, but they, didn't, they wouldn't care about theology. They wouldn't think about these things. It's like Christmas yeah. comes along, they'll celebrate with their families. That's it, you know? That's it. Oh, okay. Right. <clears throat> so, yes, yeah, so go on. Grade nine, IB program. I'm really happy because I, I finally, you know, while grade eight was important for me because it, it helped me um, over the summer, between grade seven to grade eight, 
I, I, I came to terms more with my uh, anxiety, my social anxiety of not being able to speak to people. Grade eight, it was great for me to connect to people more and, and open up more, not, not be so afraid of judgment from other kids of different, different backgrounds, the majority background. Um, I, I, got, I felt really lonely inside because, you know, these kids, they don't care about religion. They don't care about asking the deeper questions. And I myself, I myself didn't, I, I don't think I give them a, a chance either because I'm still discovering myself. I'm not confident enough at that point to try to nurture them, right? I'm just expecting them to be prepared to talk to me about the things I like, right? So I felt lonely inside because I'm like, I don't feel like these kids really, they, they don't really get life. They're just, they're so comfortable, you know, they're, they don't have any crises. They don't have any kinds of identity crises that I can see. What's up? You know, like, why are they so comfortable? Why are they so happy just doing normal kid things here? Like recess, lunch, and they'll joke about hockey and football. And uh, outside the girls and the guys are they're starting to talk to each other, you know, form those little circles and clicks. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, man, something, something's missing. That's how I felt. And a, a part of that was true. There was something missing. These were kids who got comfortable and complacent because they got everything handed to them. They're secure. But uh, on, the other, on, the, on the other hand, <coughs> it was also me not being secure enough, not being able to just be in the, in the moment and, and, and connect to other people, these kids as humans and, and form genuine relationships with them. You know, I, it was almost like I still, I still hadn't learned relationship and socializing mechanisms and mechanics enough to realize that you don't have to always have deep conversations about theology. You can just talk to someone about their, their reactions and their thoughts. And that's enough sometimes. I still wasn't at that point. <clears throat> and I, I, when I think back to that, I start to, started to realize that a lot of these brothers, you know, who are, who are on Facebook and on Twitter, and all they do is talk about giving da'wah and da'i, they act as da'is. I realized that a lot of them, they haven't actually developed identities and person, personalities independent of that language. So if you take that away from them, that the whole Dao scene, they, they'll feel completely lost. They can't socialize with people anymore. Hundred percent agree. Hundred percent agree. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, I I think I tweeted about this a while back that like Muslims with personalities, and then like I put like heart emojis on it because Muslims they don't tend to have personalities mm -hmm. other than Islam itself. So yeah. being able yeah. to develop something else besides <coughs> it's a well, very very important aspect I mean, yeah like the personality parts right because you see islam cleans up your personality it doesn't just you know change it and just put you like like a like a what you call it like a staple personality like a standard one like it's different right yeah you see the yeah personality <laughs> you see yeah. like they're all high iman righteous muslims yet they, they differ right the personality is different, different. And yes that's okay. absolutely right that's or okay. Musa, salam, right his personality mm -hmm. is different from isa alayhi salam right so like it, it's, it's, yeah. it's important that you mention that because it's like <clears throat> there's it's one thing to to live islam in, a, in an affirmative way a proactive way where you where you are developing your own personality and you're interacting with the real world around you in the present what you actually go through you're forming your own reactions to those things you're and you're making or you're developing real world connections versus what a lot of these people do and what i did living in in in, in negation you're defined by refuting everything else around you. Negating, negating, negating. This you're you're is, reactionary. Yeah, you're reactionary. And right? you don't want to construct anything either. You want to construct anything. That's exactly it. And so it's like, I started, I started to realize that I was getting pulled into that. But I first, had to go, I first had to go deep enough so that I could learn, okay, I've, I've developed very good refutation skills, but I'm still not living affirmatively. I'm still not, I'm not, I'm not constructing and that happened later, probably in my 20s, to be honest, in my 20s. What, 20s. what do you mean by the difference between refuting everything and constructing? If you want to elaborate a little bit more on that. Sure. <coughs> let's, say, let's say I can critique haram dating culture and say this is haram because it contradicts the Quran and Sunnah and Hanifi Fiqh establishes this fatwa on of an illegitimate boyfriend girlfriend relationship. Okay, cool. Um, let's I get really good. I can even cite statistics on the divorce rate of couples who cohabitate before marriage. You know, I, I memorize all these facts, Zuck like your next style. <laughs> but when it comes down to me demonstrating and modeling 
a functional marriage where I'm actually able to keep my wife's interest, be attract, be an attractive, confident Muslim man, lead her with a clear direction, with healthy frame control skills, and on a stable foundation of marriage. How many people can do that? We call it the skin in the game. That's what Amar is obsessed with his concepts. The skin in the game? Yeah, well, basically, yeah. Like, I think what you're saying, Fahim, <clears throat> uh, you're basically like, it's like people can like, they'll talk, but then they don't really have experience in doing it. And That's I think, right. Right? Yeah. And so like, the skin in the game, I think Nick, Nassim Nicholas Talib. That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Skin in the game. He, 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 he talks about um, anti-fragility and fragility. I remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All that great stuff. So but yeah, basically, you Crazy. don't, you don't ask a guy who knows how to shoot a jump shot. Like he knows the, the theory behind it. You ask, yeah. you ask the guy who actually shoots it. Hey, how do That's I right. shoot it? That's right. That's right. So, straight up. Straight up. So yeah. And, and, and or it's think, like, yeah, go ahead. It, it gets even, you know, I, I, there's, there's so much to this. It's like, there are so many, so many people lost in abstractions that they're disconnected from the real world. They don't understand what's actually happening on the ground. They're, they're literally commentating, commentating from Facebook. They have very little real, real world social experience. And any that they do have is, is from a dysfunctional perspective because maybe their own family was dysfunctional. You know, they had, they, they had kids were abuse in their family. Um, and so now they're projecting all of these lived experiences onto the rest of the world without actually going out there interacting with other people in real life. And they think that they are experts. They develop this arrogance almost, you know, that armchair critic mentality. They'll, criti they'll criticize people who are actually building foundations and models. I know an Ustad from the United Kingdom. He's, he's based out of London. I, re I really love him for the sake of Allah. His name is Ustad Moinul Abu Hamza of the Quran Institute. And he talks about this all the time that he... I love him because he has skin in the game. You know, just as you mentioned, he has skin in the game. He's, he's experienced the streets. He understands relationships pretty damn, damn well, mashallah. And when he was building his institution, there were people who have done very little affirmative work, very little proactive work, constructive work that were trying to poke holes at, well, maybe it's not perfect here or, or here or here. And it's like a model that is still getting something done is better than you sitting back and doing absolutely nothing, provided that that model is avoiding serious Tom. sins and kufr and whatnot. Yeah. Like there yeah. are some cases where just being silent and being passive is safer, for sure. But in that context, definitely not. Mm -hmm. When you're actually doing good work, it's not perfect, but yeah. the net result is good. You are definitely in a different league than the people who can't be bothered to have skin in the game. Yeah. They can't be bothered to get cuts and bruises in the process, right. refining. Exactly. And I think, uh, I think, uh, would you agree with, uh, with another thing where when you're living constantly in reaction to the environment, you don't really, yeah. uh, you, you don't really <coughs> define, you don't really, uh, you're not constructive, right? You mentioned that earlier. That's I right. Think, yeah. So you're not constructive. So you're not really like, for example, if I'm constantly reacting, okay, this, alcohol is haram, this is haram, blah, blah, blah. But I don't live my, I don't, uh, establish my rules. You know, I don't go, you know, for example, start, take initiative, right? Maybe I'll That's start right. like, Maybe we start Friday halaqa. Every Friday we get together. We you know, have a halaqa. Maybe we go train. You know, you just do right, something. Exactly. You do something halal. That's taking initiative. I'm not yes. reacting at that point. I'm trendsetting. But if you're constantly reacting, you can never trendset. Right? Perfectly said. Beautifully said. Mashallah. I love that because, you know, that brings me back to, again, folks 180. Why did it, why did it come into fruition and, and formation? Is for precisely these reasons. Is because I realized that, I can't simply live my life in negation anymore, anymore in negation mode. I have to now create a, a counter culture mm -hmm. that affirms the truths that I, I think are so beautiful. The truth of that Islam. I think can offer people solutions, right? Yeah, and precisely What's the point of me living in this reactionary state? Yeah. I, there, there are people who, who will speak about Khilafah all day and night, right? Mm -hmm. Sure, we all agree on that. But when it comes down to it, they couldn't, if you put them in charge of building one, it would be a, an utter disaster like a train wreck because they have no clue what they're doing. They have very little real world experience. They, they, they will criticize enormous structures like uh, capitalism. Yeah. Boring off yeah. Of sure. Marxist critiques, but mm -hmm. they don't even understand how to, to produce a working Islamic economy. If you, if you told them to, and I get it, you don't have to be able to do everything. That's fine. You don't need to be able to be the, the, the be all and end all, but you have to be aware if you're being, if you're getting imbalanced and you have to recognize that if you are, 
you should put time into constructive living and not be trapped in this self-righteous, you know, armchair critic mode, because that's not going to fulfill any of the very things you yourself claim you care about on Facebook, on Twitter, you know, especially with this, this outrage culture, you don't even know how to measure justice. You talk about social justice all day and night. You don't even know, you don't know how to, you don't even know how to measure it properly. You're so, mm -hmm. you're so good at showing, uh, patterns of virtue signaling online, but in your own life, you can't do it <clears throat> properly. Even online, the way you respond to things is inconsistent. So I see these patterns all the time. Yeah. Um, I'll give you a classic example. The way people reacted to Nabil Aziz on the right. boys in the cave. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I was, I was misconstrued so many times for defending everything that Nabil Aziz says by some people or enabling Nabil Aziz by some people, even though I had, cre I had been on the Mad Mamluks podcast for like an hour articulating my position very clearly yeah to myself how can i trust these people to put forth solutions when they can't even bother to listen to someone who spent an hour on a podcast and hear what they actually have to say and then provide a sound response meanwhile mm -hmm. these same people were sitting ducks crickets when when it came to critiquing people like muhammad gilan and his stance on evolutionary theory whether or not you agree that he did anything wrong. The point being is that if you, if people were consistent, you would, you would expect that they would show consistent criticism. Exactly. Yeah. And they have a very passive aggressive demeanor to them as well in general. Yeah. Sorry. Can you repeat that? They have a very passive aggressive demeanor to them as well yeah. in general. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Passive aggressive. And like you said, they're inconsistent. They're, uh, they're inconsistent. Like it's because you, you, I, I remember you, you like the whole Nabil Aziz thing. You went on that podcast and you, mm -hmm. uh, you like you, you know you you articulated your ideas your thoughts blah blah, blah like everything right and mm -hmm. people just just ignored that they're just attacking the bill and the funny thing is like you said they'll they'll critique the bill for certain things but then they'll have total like straight up deviance that yeah come, and no one's gonna say the no same one nothing. thing right and, and then, wow. then this it makes you realize a couple of things right that it's not actually <clears> about <throat> Islam or being consistent it's just about disagreeing yeah. with a certain philosophy and just like that's right it's just it goes into the a bigger discussion of like gynocentrism and stuff <coughs> and uh i think the inconsistencies <clears throat> inconsistencies you were saying uh like i think uh, could you like elaborate about that yeah sure see what you mentioned is important it's like you said it's not just about islam because a lot of people will wear that that badge of oh this is for the sake of islam or i'm i'm, I'm reacting I'm, I'm reacting on behalf of the cause of Islam and, and, and with regards to its principles. But really, <clears throat> these same people, <clears throat> I'm not going to say these same people, that's, that's too vague, but you'll yeah. notice patterns in people who aren't fully congruent and who aren't consistent, such that they, they, they haven't recognized their own biases. They will, they will criticize other people. They will criticize other people for being too biased towards, say, let's say, the right, right? Yeah. And but then, yet, they will not that. even recognize the crystal clear examples in plain daylight of them being biased towards leftist critiques of the right or leftist views, right? Mm -hmm. For example, yeah. <clears throat> you ask some of them, do you believe that there is still a patriarchy in the West? They'll say, yes. They'll say, well, here's an example of this is of the, the, the wage gap. And I'll, and I'll be like, well, you come from a, a particular sub demographic that says we shouldn't, we as Muslims shouldn't involve ourselves in the culture clash of, of right versus left. You said that. And here you are taking from the left and their criticism of the right. Because this is a leftist mm -hmm. argument that there's a wage Wait, gap yeah. in Canada and America. You know? Mm -hmm. And it's like, how, there, are there Muslims who do that? Commit similar fallacies towards the right where they, 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 they deny um, actual violations happening in the Muslim lands. I'm sure there are some, but the number but of minority. who actually commit analogous fallacies, mm -hmm. tiny, 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 tiny minority. Tiny. Yeah. Can't, I, I don't think, I can, we could probably count them on our fingers. Probably less. <laughs> Why do you think that is? <laughs> like how many Muslims would say, yeah, I'm a patriot. The war in Iraq was good. Yeah, like no when, one's gonna like say where? Probably like one guy, really. He's kind yeah. of like, anyways. <laughs> like he's black, but like his grandpa is Muslim. Maybe, exactly. Maybe like that. But generally, no? like, yeah, it's like it's tiny. Like, and, the, 
yeah, it's not about Islam. It's just about, it's about like a different, like this goes into, and this is what I was going to say too. Like a lot of these guys, like you said, they're, inc- they're incongruent. Like on hmm. social media, they'll show an image. This is like why when I started, I was kind of, I, I don't, this is why I'll, I'll, I'll like occasionally I'll trash talk on social media because I'm not a religious account. Like, yeah, I, have a beard, <laughs> yeah, I know what's right and wrong, but I'm not a right. <coughs> I just know their values, but I'm still like, yo, I'm still like a late Muslim. Hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, but like yeah. these other accounts will act like they're all. At least you're legit. honest, man. At least you're honest. Yeah. Okay. I'm sure. Like, hey, I'll I'll say stuff. I'll say stupid things. But hey, I'm not, but don't think I'm so religious. Like, yeah, I have a beard, but that's it. Mm-hmm. That's the easy mm-hmm. part. <laughs> that's uh, a lot. That's a lot more noble than, you know, wearing this mask of piety. Mm-hmm. The the mask of piety. But isn't it good to yeah. have it both on like, in reality and in person, as well as offline as well? I mean, sorry, in person as well as online as well. Having that mask of piety, or do you think that just makes you like fake and unrelatable, and you don't really have a personality outside of Islam? I think that what you should have, what you should have, is um, an inner struggle of genuinely trying to adhere to Islamic principles. Yes, where you know that you're failing because everyone, everyone on the on the on the hypocrisy spectrum, everyone is somewhere along it, right? Mm-hmm. So. As long as you can own up to the fact that yes, there are aspects of my life that are incongruent, there are aspects of my life that are that I'm working on. There are parts of Islam that I still haven't fully integrated into myself, but because I believe in it, I also believe that public sinning is worse than private sinning. And therefore, even if my condition is such that I, I gravitate towards doing this sin, I have to try to not do it publicly. I have to try my very best to 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 do it only in a private context, if ever at all, while working on eliminating it altogether, because that I believe in Islam. I believe in Islam. And I know, I know that I'm not being fully congruent, right? That's a lot <laughs> different than walking around with a, an invested mask, right? That you're not even aware of anymore, where you are, or even, even worse, you're purposely portraying it without taking any responsibility for your, the diseases of your heart. And that would take the for- responsibility would take the form of being able to own up to your mistakes, being able to take accountability, actively working on things in your life, you know, having humility, <clears throat> and not judging other people, except disproportionately, you know, not judging other people disproportionately, like we see on Twitter. Yeah, on Twitter, oh, exactly. And this kind of others, stop watching pornography. You are disgusting animals. I. N- how many of those same dudes Go have fuck. watched it or watched it themselves? Yeah. Right? And, and they know very well why. They, they feel it every single day. It's a problem. Of course, you have to say we have to enjoy the good and forbid the evil. But there's a way to do it while being an empathetic, congruent human being that understands, yo, listen, we're all screwed up in some way, shape, or form. We exist in a dysfunctional environment. I get it. Is it cutting out? Yeah, it's cutting out. Give people <coughs> um, the last fifteen seconds are just cut out. Okay, I'm back now. Yeah, you're yeah. back now. Yeah. So you're saying uh there's, there's a way to empathetically enjoy what is good, private, what is evil. And then, yes. <clears throat> when I say empathetically, what I mean is congruently as well. What I mean is you're doing it in a, in a way that's proportional to the actual reality that you're addressing. If you know that you yourself struggled with some sin and it's because of great environmental problems and family dysfunctions, let's look at two examples. Parents making marriage a living hell, getting married a living hell. Okay. And the environment, uh, manipulating the male libido, uh, excusing poor standards of female sexuality, misleading women and men into thinking that this is this is the way to, to to yeah, uh, the whole boyfriend girlfriend culture as well. Well, what's gonna happen? People are gonna turn to the easiest outlets that are convenient, that are incentivized, you know, that are that are programmed to to appeal to the nuffs instead of mm-hmm. the hard work of fixing the root problems. You're gonna so, feel that tension to 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 succumb to convenience. <clears throat> now, if you know all this, acting like you're this saved wali saint on Twitter, 
and you're blasting all the guys instead of actually offering them a means to rectify their condition, showing them yeah. you understand their condition, understanding that there are reasons that are out of their own, that, that are not their fault either for why that condition exists. Why should anyone listen to you? Yeah. Right? Well, they'll also blast, forget that, they'll also blast other people that are doing things that are maybe halal in Islam, right? Like polygamy gets blasted, for example. Yeah. Right? Oh, you're just a perv. What do you mean, bro? <clears throat> like, uh, or things like, this <clears throat> kind of goes into the whole, when people will white knight, they'll, uh, they'll, they'll kind of, They'll become religious. Oh, you know, the Prophet he married a woman so older than him, him. Awesome. right? A divorcee older than him, right? And yeah. then you go, like, well, he also married, he also had more than one wife. But when that comes yeah, up, yeah. oh, brother, different time, different place, right? I bring that example up a lot, but you can see that it's not about the Sunnah. It's not about Islam. It's about like a... My Sunnah. Getting attention, you know, from women <clears> and stuff. <throat> not like necessarily. Sorry, not, go on. I was going to say, not even necessarily from like attention from women is just that they're picking and choosing parts of the sunnah that is convenient for them mm -hmm. and people have a tendency yeah. to do that Con confirm confirm confirmation bias. bias yeah confirmation bias yeah. Right. And i think that you even said you've seen a lot of inconsistencies like personally you know people oh yeah you know oh absolutely absolutely right yeah <clears throat> and this is why when when i try to address this issue i always stress that we have to we have to learn how to think thinking one on one you know, the thing that I, st I started trying to do when I was like 12, looking at answeringchristianity.com, I finally realized later how essential that is. Because if you don't know how to judge, if you don't have sound judgment, sound thinking, then everything else is downhill from there. Your relationships, your assessments of, of enjoining the good and forbidding the evil, how you end up actually executing that, all of that is going to be affected by your ability or inability to exact sound and clear thinking people don't care about this though they yo, don't want to develop thinking yo have you noticed that like when people start practicing islam <clears throat> like they, maybe from the age that they're born till 20 years old they don't practice islam properly but then as soon as they hit like 20 years old for example they start practicing islam like extreme to an extreme level yeah okay yeah yeah and these people become some of the harshest people i've ever met so like, you, don't, man. you don't even want to be around them <clears throat> imbalance and incongruent imbalance and incongruent there's a term for that it's called uh salafi burnout <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah the salafi burnout i was just thinking that <laughs> the salafi burnout it, it happens and like a lot of these, a lot of these people who end up joining isis like previously they weren't really that religious at all <clears throat> that's true yeah they just went to the opposite extreme and yeah. learned from yeah. some yeah i don't want to say extreme because the ideology is co-added so I would say they just learned their religion from the wrong place. That's right. A lot of them were naive, naive kids. Yeah. They didn't have... Exactly naive, angry. Earlier. They weren't living constructively. They were living in, in a reactionary state. Exactly. Reactionary. Yeah. They're angry. They're young. They're angry. Fiery. Isolated. Fiery. <laughs> they're not married. No, but you they're know, honestly, married. these kids they're are probably... Some, these kids are probably some of the most motivated members within our ummah. If you think about it. They, they, they needed the correct stewarding, but yeah, they had, they had the fuel. They had fuel. Okay. It was just misplaced and they were taken advantage of. Wrong place, wrong time. What happened. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> That's what happens, you know? Yeah. yeah. So, um, so tie back into uh, your Brad, Mr. Focus 180. So Focus 180. Okay. So the yeah. tangent we took, um, it's still, it's still, it's very much connected in the sense that. Yeah, exactly. I was just about to say. So like, it, so yeah, folk, yeah. Mr. Focus 180 it came out of the intersection of a spiritual crisis, a security crisis. Whoa, whoa, social, whoa, whoa. I would say, I would say, I would say a, a, a social, a, a perpetual state of social anxiety, a perpetual yeah. state of social anxiety. Yeah. And, and then, so anxiety. you made this, you made this brand, right? And you basically, what you yeah. take men and you teach young Muslims and you, what you basically get them in shape, <clears throat> teach them mentally how to lead themselves, define their values. <clears throat> like, what do you, yes. what do you do exactly? Yes. Right? Like, yes. With your clients. All the above. Alhamdulillah. Um, it's, it's about teaching them how to live a constructive life as a competent man and how to undo all the harmful programming they have in, inevitably received by growing up in a secular liberal society, right? Mm -hmm. We as Muslims, as much as some will say we need to step out of the culture war between the right and the left, if you live in a non-Muslim land, it's going, it's going to affect you. You're gonna, you need to have an opinion on it. And you also need to diagnose how much of it has affected you 
your, your, your thinking patterns and your behavioral patterns, because <clears throat> you can't stay out of it if you're already in it and you've, you're already drowning in it, right? You can't just be magically told, stay out of it. You're, you're already drowning in it. You need to figure out where you stand and where, you, where you're supposed to go from there. So Focus 180 was meant to offer primarily young Muslim boys a model that they can aspire to, to become more functional. And when I say functional, I define that as reconnecting to their fitra and following the Quran and Sunnah in light of the, the uh, tra tradition of scholarship that we have received. Yeah, orthodox. And that will include, right? That will include considering the evidence of their senses. You know, we don't, we don't, we don't disregard making observations of your society and looking at what people in your society, even if they're non-Muslims, have discovered to be true or mm -hmm. what they've learned from trial and error. We don't, we don't just discard that, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> because some people think that, oh, if we follow the Quran and Sunnah, that means we can't take from anything else. We can't learn from anything else. Some, the extreme of this was, oh, you shouldn't study philosophy. Haram. You shouldn't study mm -hmm. philosophy. It's haram. You can't study logic. It's like... Yeah. I mean, even then, like, it was... like. I think you need to study <clears throat> basic philosophy to just refute. Yeah. Or so, or you yeah. need to have like, like, I think Daniel Kikuchi, we talked about it. He's like, not to take philosophy 101, you want to take certain, <clears throat> like certain <throat> branches of it. And of um, course, there's, there's ways to prepare you. Before yeah, you exactly. Start. Like you need like your base to be sound. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. Like, going into specifics. So focus you, on 180. Yeah. Sorry, go going into specifics, how do you get your clients to become the people that they that you want them to become or that they or want they, to become yeah what they want to become sure <clears throat> so basically focus on 180 the way it started was um i was running sort of boot camp styled fitness camps on my university fields big soccer fields they were called the columbia uh ice fields and um this was actually university down the street from mines but it was big enough that i could have 15 guys easily come out spend an hour doing high intensity interval training, calisthenics, bit of boxing, just something to get them moving. Because at this point, I was like 18, 19. I still didn't have my full vision cohesively joined. I, I found people like Elliot House and I thought that oh, they yeah. were like really cool because I was like, he was, he was the first guy I saw that synthesized working out, being visibly strong and also talking about character, right? Everyone else didn't have that. They would only do one, one piece. And usually it was just working out. So these guys would come out one hour, three times a week, we'd work out. And then afterwards we might do like a halakha of some, of some kind, 15 minutes. One of the senior brothers would hold it and they would discuss different topics relating to uh, attaining virtuous character, um, relating to time management, relating to um, dealing with your nafs in the environments that we're in. So for example, how do you deal with the, the temptation to, uh, enter illicit relationships or the temptation to go and watch pornography, you know, to go fap, fap in your, in your, in your bathroom after school. To be blunt. <laughs> you know? Let's be real. Half you guys who are listening to this, you need to sign up and get fixed. <laughs> Don't even BS yourselves. <laughs> Anyways, people are at this point. I'm not even, I'm not even charging these guys anything. Cause I, I'm, I'm solely experimenting getting data. It's a very new idea. No one really understands what I mean at this point when I'm saying things like we need, we need to revive like uh, manhood or masculinity. And they're like, what does that, what are you talking about? It's constructive yeah. things like even like the platform that we have, for example. Yeah. What did you ask me? What do I think of it? No, no, no. So like I'm saying that con constructive things, like even the platform that we're trying to generate as well. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Constructive things of that nature that will help men understand their actual function in society right from an islamic perspective a perspective rooted in reality that's that's essentially it because if you don't know that well how then what, what do you have left to do when it comes to making decisions how to behave what what kind of direction in life to take you know these three things you will not know how to answer those questions in in general or let alone in specific if you don't have that framework. So let's look at something specific, how to behave in a relationship with your wife. Let's say your wife, um, <clears throat> your wife is feeling um, pressured because 
a lot of her colleagues have this have this culture of going out after work and they all take they take you know instagram stories of themselves you know doing like this those cute things that the girls like doing duck faces um putting their cheeks together bunny ears and she she doesn't have too many muslims around her muslim girls let alone muslim anyone right um um and so she's feeling this this pressure of being lonely what's going to happen in that vacuum if it's not filled what's going to happen to her and 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 her social her her social deficit if it's not filled a lot of things can happen she could go into depression if she she might be strong enough to still stay away from them but she might go into depression or she may cave in and start hanging out with them getting influenced by that group culture and regardless of what happens you as the husband have to know her well enough to understand where this deficit is going to end up manifesting and you have to establish equilibrium a balanced state in this case the deficit is a lack of social connection a lack of maybe attention you have to fill that deficit as a man by first being able to read it and then knowing how to meet it making her feel reassured making her feel cherished making her feel connected finding muslims and then creating out reaching out and, and building relationships proactively as a man then bringing her into that space as a, as a man who goes out right how can you do any of that if you don't even know that that's your duty that's your function and you've been given the god given uh prerequisite conditions to do that you have you have the biology to do that you even have the 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 the, the spiritual hardware to do that you know the the the, the portion of jalal and jamal that a man is created with tends to be more on the side of jalal than a woman right do you, are you guys familiar with what these terms mean jalal and jamal for our viewers probably not so what are they? <clears throat> jalal refers to an energy of sort of awesomeness you know awesomeness like look at a lion that's a manifestation of jalal the the, the mane of a lion basking in the sunlight jalal jamal is like you see this mother deer how it's like licking its baby tenderly that's like a manifestation of jamal and th- these are from our tradition these are these are not bidda these are from our tradition right you know mm-hmm. so it's like if a muslim man didn't know this if he didn't realize wait a second these are these are real things properties of my very self and other brothers we might have different proportions of these maybe you have a bit more jalal than your friend but both of you are going to have on average more jalal than a woman right sure. have some but both of you are going to have more than her, most likely, like 99% of the time. Um, if you don't know that, how are you going to restore order and equilibrium in that situation? Yeah. How do I try to right. teach to these brothers? And oh, yeah, no, not I didn't know any that. of this back when I started these, these uh, group sessions on the fields. Because at that point, I thought, what's the one thing that's the easiest to spot? What the, the easiest aspect of their male condition to spot is their physical self. They're out of shape. Many of them are obese. Their estrogen levels are too high. Their testosterone is too low. There's an imbalance already. That's going to lead to other factors like dep- heightened depression, uh, problematic fertility rates, <clears throat> erectile dysfunction, an unbalanced mood. Anxiety. Yeah. Say, say that again. Anxiety. I was, I was going to say. Oh, neuroticism is what I said. Neuroticism. Yeah. Same thing. Yeah, you're, exactly. Neuroticism. Yeah. High, high, high in neuroticism. They're going to score higher in neuroticism. Mm. And <clears throat> I think a lot of the sort of liberal progressive types and even people who are unknowingly sympathetic towards those, towards a bias to them, they mock uh, people like us when we mention testosterone. They're like, oh, these guys are just like those stupid bros. You know, they're just like those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Bros. Oh, toxic masculinity. All that toxic masculinity. Huh? I'm yeah. like, <clears throat> the reason you built this world. <laughs> Wait, say that again, Amon? Like, masculinity built this world. Like, your dad was a guy. Your dad went to work. Your dad <laughs> put money on the table. Your dad bought food on the table. Your dad paid for your stupid liberal art degree. <clears throat> <laughs> quite literally so like, yes and you're and you're talking time about it it's just so and you know, mm-hmm. like when you mentioned the it's like you said islam gives us the qualities like right there's a hadith right all of us every one of you is a shepherd right we're the shepherds for our family so we have to mm-hmm. lead our families like you know like and it's not only just absolutely financial, yes financial right it's islamic 
right? Mm. You're, you got to teach your kid, your, your wife, your kids, all of them, <coughs> right? And it's, uh, it's like, it's, it's a duty. Like people, mm. like you have this weird left, like, again, a lot of Muslims are influenced by liberalism and they go like, they try to like reinterpret or, you know, get influenced yeah. by egalitarian, postmodern Absolutely. BS. But it's still so progressive, it, it, Amar. Yeah, progressive. Yeah, that's the word, right? <laughs> and there's, we have, a, we have like the Sahaba, we have the, them as role models and we have the whole, we we have the template. We we need to go back to that and follow that. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And and Absolutely. to lead to lead. We need to, and as men, like you said, I love your I love the idea of your brand of where you're teaching men how to lead themselves and bring back the tradition, and then then bring after the that tradition. they can be men Yo, but and then lead others. Tradition. How do you specifically do that though? So let me let me get to that. I'm going to get to that because that's I understand that we need to cover that because otherwise people are going to be like, okay, so these are the ideals. How do you do that? And there is a very specific way I do achieve this. Alhamdulillah, it requires intensive training, usually in the context of one-on-one or small group coaching, right? But I'll get to that in just a moment. So I just wanted to say that <clears throat> see, some some critics of or some people who who tend to be skeptical of the the need for you know masculinity say well oh historically in agrarian societies women had to do a lot of unpaid labor you know they had to do a lot of farming they had to they had to they had to to lean in and there is truth to this and there are societies <laughs> where, you know, right now like look bangladesh for example uh, the Very poor true. class of women especially are laboring in sweatshops in very unfortunate conditions but likewise there are a poor class of men who are laboring in, in, in ridiculous conditions like ship graveyards where they're getting their limbs cut off. That's actually putting their families, including the women, in greater risk because now that they've lost the man who is the primary breadwinner, even amongst these poor, the poor class of people. And then that puts the women into terrible conditions. So when, when I hear these complaints, I start to understand, okay, they're, they're usually coming from a place of, well, what, what's the point of manhood where, when in these societies, these women are still suffering? And I think to myself, <clears throat> that's true. There are women suffering in these societies, and we need to acknowledge this. But that's not because of, is, uh, uh, of, of affirmative Islamic men enacting the, the actual systems of Islam. That's because of the absence of, of, of those systems. That's, that's because of, of, of many... Um, un-Islamic systems and their byproducts. That's not because of. That's not because of uh, uh, of men enacting the, the very principles that we're trying to in, incul- in, inculcate in them, to inculcate in them. And in fact, if 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 they even they understand, like in these low classes, even if they, if, if even they understand that it's the it's, it's the men who have to go out to these ship graveyards, not the women, but it's the men who have to go out to these ship graveyards. Then even they have an understanding that we need men who are dependable because if our, let's say our, our son or our, our, our father didn't want to go out to work, it's going to fall on us. It's going to worsen our quality of life. Right? So they'll point out examples of, of cases that aren't actually capturing what we're talking about. They're mischaracterizing the whole point we're making, which is that men who are, who are actually functioning properly are, are good for everyone. It's a win-win situation. Those women won't simply be allowed to stay in that in those terrible conditions. If you had a, a collective of Muslim men who wanted to actually enact Islam, that that wouldn't remain the, a long term situation. You know, like Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu went and fed a poor woman. He prepared the meal in the pot. I, I remember seeing this for the first time on. Remember that sh- that show Omar series? Yeah. Yeah, I heard. I, I didn't watch it, but I know what you're talking about. I watched the first <clears> episode <throat> of that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or say then Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, when he's the caliph, he went and he, he took care of people in the society. Mm. To, so the solution to these problems isn't to destroy Islamically sound hierarchies and prerequisite you know, attributes that men need to be able to put forth these Islamic solutions. That's not the solution. The solution is to actually give them that training so they can do it. So it's like, <clears throat> from whatever perspective you look at it, most of the most people, I think the biggest problem is they don't actually understand what guys like us are trying to do or why we're trying to do it. They think that we don't understand that all these problems exist. And I'm like, well, I don't allow the women in my family to go through that. Why? Yeah. There's a reason why. Yeah, there's you know? a duty. Because I understand these things. Mm-hmm. I have the spine, alhamdulillah, to not allow that. 
I'm, I'm not going to allow that. <clears throat> if as much as I can control it, I'm not going to allow it. You know, I understand mm -hmm. that the environment is, is crap, but I myself as an individual man won't allow it. So it's like back to what you're saying, uh, Fahad, what you asked about how do I achieve this? Well, it's simple, <clears throat> but it takes a lot of work. And, and the program evolved from simply bootcamp styled um, sessions right. to three services, 180 fitness, 180 MMA, 180 principles. And the 180 principles part is where the, the majority, the majority of this kind of training is done. I will do sessions either in person or on zoom with people who clients who are at a distance guiding them through a curriculum that teaches them that teaches them the concepts that they need to understand to rethink their their function as men the design and function of women the basis of how relationships work how attraction works and they will actually practice enacting those principles in real time with me i can see their face i can see how neurotic they are i can see what's holding them back for example from being able to be committed to a principle or to an idea and thought or feeling. What does that tell me? Some people are, well, what does that have to do with uh, being, a, being a man? Well, it's very simple. <clears throat> if we can extract that commitment is central to manhood, then we can, we, can, we, can, we can develop training programs that help men become more committed. And, and, and when I say committed, I don't just mean in a very generic sense where people will be like, well, aren't women supposed to be committed to? I'm talking about in a uniquely uh, psychosocial and neurobiological way that corresponds to religious duties specific to men. The first part of what I said, if you study the big five factors of personality, mm -hmm. which is yeah. a very well studied aspect of personality psychology, so, and you study. But, yeah, I know them. It's um, openness to experience. That's the first one. Ocean. Um, C is conscientiousness. <clears throat> extrovertedness, agreeableness, and neuroticism. Exactly. Exactly. <coughs> Sorry. And if you study the um, uh, distribution of behaviors amongst men and women, their, their relative proportions, you'll see that even something like commitment and accountability is manifested in men and women differently. A man is on average more assertive than a woman, especially if he has training. You take the most competitive men, you equalize all variables, you take the most aggressive women, you, and you take the most aggressive men. On average, the most aggressive men are always gonna win, right? Yeah. Uh, always. <clears throat> Progressive people and liberal liberals who deny gender differences, those types of liberals, they will always try pitting unequal cases. They'll be like, well, what always, about Ronda Rousey? Always power structures. Yeah. Power structures oh, and Ronda, Ronda, Ronda 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 Rousey. Ronda Rousey. It's like, what would happen then? It's like, yeah. you're, you're asking what would happen if Ronda Rousey fought you? You'd get your, 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 your butt whooped. I agree. Yeah. I agree you would. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Put her up against Khabib. What's going to happen to her? See ya. She'll give her, she'll say her shahada. <laughs> she'll probably put on a hijab. Just make me second wife. <laughs> it's about Allah. So it's like, <clears throat> they know this too. Even if, if, if you even look at who Ronda married, she married Travis Brown, this six foot five heavyweight UFC contender. Why? Mm -hmm. Why didn't she? Why didn't she marry one of you guys, the ones who who, who would tell her all day and night, "Oh, you could beat me up." Why didn't she? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> so the distribution of these traits are different. The, even how they manifest are different. <clears throat> Commitment and, and assertiveness have a connection. Me committing to my thought and my, and my feelings under pressure is going to be easier if I'm more assertive. Someone's trying to disagree with me. Someone's trying to threaten me. If I'm assertive, I'm going to be able to commit to my, my values more. It's not, a, it's not a mystery why Muslim men were in charge or, 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 or were delegated responsibilities that usually correspond to, having, to needing assertiveness, protecting the, 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 the borders of a Muslim land, protecting their home. Right, mm -hmm. giving tarbiya and the family, mm -hmm. these all are are more well suited if you have these prerequisite behaviors, right? Yeah, and the machinery to be able to fulfill those requirements, right? So it's like if we accepted these things, well, we well, 
brothers these things, they can actually optimize these behaviors. Just as brothers have uh, um, certain behaviors and traits that are distributed amongst them more than sisters do, sisters likewise have certain ones that are distributed amongst them more than brothers. And those are likewise suited for particular tasks that lo and behold, we find correspond to what the Sharia enjoins upon them, right? Yeah. There's a correspondence. Is that a coincidence? I don't think so because <clears throat> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created means for us to fulfill our duties. Yes. You know, we, were, we were told to pray five times a day and we were, we, were, we were told to do so in a way that allows us to use our legs and, and our hands and arms in a natural way. Were we told mm -hmm. to go backwards? Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. We, if we were, we'd still obey. We would still obey. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. That's, 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 that's a, a, a premise we all accept. We would still obey. But the fact is we weren't, right? So, and there are mm -hmm. some things, there are some things we may not understand. We may never find a means for why it is that way. But yeah. the point is, when there is a clear correspondence, it's a very unwise thing for us to ignore that, right? Yeah. And so I teach this to the brothers in my sessions, one hour, three times a week, or two times a week. And we go through a curriculum that goes through these points very in depth. And then we have exercises where I, I, will, I will push them to talk. I will push a brother who has severe social anxiety, could never control the frame in, in a social setting, uh, in his own family, and I will push him to start learning to be committed to his actual thoughts and his actual feelings. You know, what do you mean by frame control for the people who don't know? Just, a quick, just a quick definition of frame control for the people who don't know. <clears throat> okay. Frame control would be um, expectation management. You know, you have certain expectations. I have certain expectations. Mr. Bro Buffbeard has certain expectations. <laughs> <Bro>. <laughs> and... <laughs> We, we have to, if we want to work together as a group, or we want our relationship to work, we need to know how to fulfill each other's needs and our, our own needs. And so therefore we need to be able to um, uh, enforce our expectations with each other. So let's say I want to go eat because I'm hungry and one of you isn't hungry and you don't want to go eat. What's going to happen? There's going to be a conflict. How do we resolve that? Right? That's where expectation management skills come, come into play. If you, were, if you were trapped in uh, a neurotic state, you're never going to be clear about what's, what's really going on in, in your head. You're going to be in a chronically frustrated state. People are going to be violating your boundaries. And likely, you're going to reach a breaking point where you will therefore snap in a very disproportionate way. And then you're going to probably viola violate their boundaries passive aggressively, right? Yeah. This happens with women all the time. The guys who are involved in domestic violence very often are the guys who have poor frame control and they have poor congruence. They can't actually be straightforward from the get-go. They mm -hmm. are passive aggressive. They let their problems build up. They're always in a chronic state of frustration and anger. They're not in a, in a, in a very leveled, balanced state. They're the ones who get in, in, into these problems. You know, yeah. people who are fundamentally incongruent, they're not authentically grounded. And so people on people, especially amongst liberals and progressives and on the left, they, they try to characterize us as the type of guys, you know, who are going to be going on a, on a beating spree and, and mm -hmm. we're going to be the ones to fail with women. And I'm like, <clears throat> every sister who I have, I have spoken to about these concepts with every single one of them who really invested in, in hearing me out has been nothing but impressed they will say things like, can we buy this for our brothers or can we, can we refer our husbands to you? I've had, I've had women in, in, in refer their husbands to me. I've had sisters refer their brothers to me, you know? Yeah. Because they, they understand. <laughs> the you sisters know? are like, I make my husband more like you. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that has happened, by the way. But what? I don't condone it. It has happened. I'm serious. I, I told the sister once, I was like, listen, don't tell him that because... He's not going to Yeah, that's, that's oh, an L. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, she's a good sister, mashallah. She's a good sister. Um, her husband and her got married at like 20. And so they were struggling. The guy, he came from an abusive family. So he was, he, he was exactly as, we, as what I mentioned. The characteristic nice guy who simply couldn't competently navigate his needs in a relationship, let alone meet the, meet the woman's needs, you know? 
making her do all this mind reading, making her go through all this tension of being the leader in that, in that relationship. You know, it's like, she doesn't want to do that. No, That's she why she's, she's, she's so frustrated yeah. and insecure. But, yeah, What's wrong with being a nice guy? <clears throat> Sorry? What's wrong with being a nice guy? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I heard that book. Yeah, the um, No More Mr. Nice Guy by, uh, what's his name? Robert, Robert Green, I think. Or Robert Glover. Like, Are you Robert familiar Glover, with that okay. I'm familiar with it, yeah. What about you? Am I? I, 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 haven't, I haven't read it. I've heard about it. Okay. Uh, but no, I never read it. But yeah, I know what you're talking about. It's uh, a lot of these people, <clears throat> the thing is, they're not, they're not upfront. They're not honest with how they feel. Yeah. So, yeah. Like, so they become passive aggressive. Their they anger passive builds up over time and then and, they snap. And they offer <clears> something <throat> called implicit contracts. Well, yeah, implicit yeah, contracts. Yeah. yeah, that's the the frame control example. Like a good example, I I, I get this from experience, right? If you, for example, let's say I, I meet I have a friend, and right when I meet him, we hang out every single day, four hours a day, we always hang out. Then one day I'm like, yo, I, I gotta I gotta do some schoolwork, I gotta like catch up on studying, and then that guy gets pissed, and he doesn't understand, oh, man. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because and this has happened to me before. But anyways, the the implicit expectation was, hey, we'll always hang out. But I, I didn't set the boundaries early on. So whether it's explicit or implicit, <clears throat> you set the boundaries right away. That's right. right. That's right. Whether it's implicit it's, or explicit, right? And uh, even if you want to change those boundaries and they're already implicit and you want to make them explicit, but you want them changed, of course, it's going to cause conversation. Conflict. Yeah, you have to have the conversation. And I had the conversation. And, and it's going to cause conflict kind of, a little bit. And you have to. It did cause conflict, but I mean. Just to be like, disagreeable about like, it. No, you yeah. just say it. And then now it's good. Talk, talk it out. Talk it out, right? And it's like <clears throat> a lot of the times of the new guys who come to me, they, they come with all, the, all this sloppy thinking. Like they're like, okay, we have to control the frame. So that means if you're, if you're telling us to do something, we have to resist. And I'm like, no, you imbecile. If I'm telling you something that's good for you, submit to it, accept it. You know, it's like that's where humility and, 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 and also confidence in that situation comes into play if you're actually confident and grounded you won't feel so insecure by admitting you're wrong about one thing you'll be able to accept it without shrinking down and if you're right you won't be like oh you'll, you'll be you'll be balanced you know how there's those wave functions where it's like the amplitude of the wave is like really high yeah and sometimes they're smaller right so it's a like nerd analogy but yeah like, whoosh, 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 whoosh. and i'm like you need training to recalibrate yourself so you're like more more stable in your mm -hmm. core and then you can actually say what you mean how you mean it and when people respond to you with all kinds of different reactions you're not going to be like oh i gotta shrink back down or no, you double down won't so quickly get super aggressive like i gotta fight now you know it's like both uh, yeah. are manifestations of instability and yeah, the yeah. That, right. that, that, that puffed up version and they're like, oh, that's manhood. That's manhood. And I'm like, we never said that that was optimal manhood. You guys yeah, don't even like incomplete. And that's why you have these ridiculous ideas. You, yeah. And many of them are filled with this dynamic. Like uh, the LGBTQ community has some of the highest domestic violence rates because they are fundamentally unstable people. Extreme, yeah. You know, <clears throat> bro. Yeah. a lot of these emasculated guys. They, they are very unstable. They'll be doing all kinds of strange things. They're not consistent. They'll be doing all kinds of strange things, which whether it's, you know, like ridiculously like extreme fantasies as some of them are as far as like cuckold cuckolding, like literally cuckolding yeah, or they'll, just have, they'll have an extreme addiction to something, video games, um, binge, binge watching TV shows, binge eating food. And then, then they'll go on Facebook their addiction, they're in their addiction mode. So now it's time for them to virtue signal part of their addiction, virtue signal, compensation. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Feel good yeah. about myself. You well, know? even the, the binge watching. I deal with these types of clients. Yeah, that, that, I think that's common amongst I, <clears throat> not even men. I'm saying even women, like the, <clears throat> binge eating. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Eating for sure. disorders. That's something that's like it's, it's very like common. An epidemic in this absolutely. In this uh, yes, yeah. Some of and some of this training applies to women too, in the sense that yeah. if you were to give it to them they would benefit from some of it too. But yeah. I give it to the guys because it's their job to be able to give it to their own women. Ah, yeah, exactly. Like right? once the guys are proper, women will mellow out too. And me and Amar have this mantra. Uh, Amar fix and I. Amar and I? Yeah. Okay, sure. <laughs> <clears throat> exactly. Fix, <laughs> fix, the men. <clears throat> fix the men and the women will follow. Oh, subhanAllah. Absolutely. My teacher, um, Ustad Mustafa, he's an amazing man. 
and he says that all the time that it's, if you just fix the men, the women will follow. Exactly. Instead of dealing with every individual woman that we see on Facebook or Twitter having an, an issue of some kind, some dysfunction, some some abuse case, some mm-hmm. BS even, you know, how much of that, how much how much we've seen coming from them is is complete BS too. Whatever the problem may be, if they had functional men in their lives, a lot of that would be minimized. We wouldn't yeah. see half of that. Yeah, and and to like um, uh, so, so sometimes your... these guys they'll they'll come to my house or they'll come to rented facilities or my own facility. We'll have Rujala workshops in person where every person has to listen and understand the concepts. They'll be tested on it. I'll ask them questions. I will give them immediate feedback. Sometimes they'll try to tell me what, what they think I want to hear. And I say, I don't want to hear that. All I want to hear is what you're actually thinking, even if it's wrong, because this is a space where you can afford to be wrong and unfiltered. You have to have a space where you can be congruent. Even if, if doing that outside ca- caused too much damage here, I have a vested interest in helping you. So you have to be congruent here. And they'll yeah. be like, why isn't it wrong? Shouldn't we hide our true thoughts? I'm like, no, you should become congruent and you should work on the actual issues you have internally and change them so that whatever you replace them with are things you can actually express congruently, genuinely. So for example, a guy says, I, uh, <clears throat> I have anger issues. And if I was to be congruent, wouldn't that mean that I have to constantly be yelling at people in public? Because that's how I'm really feeling. That would get me fired. I'd probably be charged with harassment. (laughs) (laughs) Bigger guys would beat me up. (laughs) And I'm like, I'm like, the reason you have these anger issues, and this was the case for him and for a lot of people, is is because you've been suppressed and incongruent for so long, you're you're at a point where you're not balanced anymore. That's what you have them to begin with. And to get back to a place of equilibrium, you need a space where you can actually be real and express it. And you can do that here. If it's too much of a risk for you to do that outside where other people aren't trained to handle you because they themselves don't know how to deal with broken people because they're broken themselves, do it here. This is where you can get your training. So he's like, wow. So he started doing it and we would hold him accountable. We would correct him. We would teach him. That's disproportionate. He would start to learn what is a proportionate way of exercising disapproval versus a, a, a proportional way. So what's a proportional way of exercising disapproval versus a disproportionate way. He went from thinking that he's cool because he's like, for him at work, you know, I was always quiet with this guy because he owed me money and I hated him inside, but I never said anything. And finally today I told him to go F off and told him he's a worthless piece of, and that he could, he better give me my money. And I'm like, how much did he owe you? And he's like, he owed me $5. Oh my what God. The <laughs> 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 okay, man. Let me teach you something about proportionality. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's pretty. Yeah. No, but I, I know exactly what you mean. I mean, you I. You know what I mean? Right? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I, I feel it. Because I even, uh, just personally, like, I've been known to be very blunt and, like, there have been situations, mm. for example, right? Like, I'll be at his friend's house and, like, his dad is saying something about <laughs> it. And I really want to argue with him. He thinks something stupid about Islam, for example. And I'm just like, <laughs> I'm like, what do I do? I, I can't, I, I don't want to like disrespect his dad. I had to go like punch something. Like, uh, so, like, exactly. Time, it's like, what do you do? Yeah. So you break conventions. So, uh, and so I, what, I, what I teach my clients and brothers is that even if there are social conventions that are in place, if those conventions aren't fitra based and they're not functional and they only cause more problems than they solve, well, then there's two things you can do. Walk you away. Can, yeah. Well, you can walk away. <laughs> yeah. But you, sh- you have to evaluate <clears throat> if you have something better that will replace that structure if, you're pre- if, you're, if you want to actually challenge it. Because if you don't and you want to you wanna pull the rug from underneath that structure and it's going to mm-hmm. collapse, you have to be prepared to have something better. Or else you've left it in a state of chaos. So what that translates into, person tries challenging the, the state of affairs, the dad in that case, but he doesn't know how to actually guide that interaction towards order. So what happens mm-hmm. is he opens up this can of worms, yes, but then the tension is never resolved. Now the dad hates you, you hate him. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, that happens. Yeah. Like, uh, for, <clears throat> like, I give, like, one example was I was, uh, I think I was 14 years old, and my one of my cousins, she wanted to... Uh, go study in the States, right? And my dad was like, 
I'm like 14 or 13. My dad is like, oh, you should get married, then go, right? Or go with your brother, right? Go with the mom, right? My dad to start like standard religious. And then someone in that room, like he, he was like, oh, don't be an extremist. And I just got pissed. I was like, <laughs> what the hell? And I was like, I got, like, what do you mean by extremist? And then my mom was like, oh, no, you should be quiet. You can talk to Ellie. Like, I'm like, no, I don't care. Like, what the hell? And then yeah. and he couldn't define extremism. And I was just like, I was also like, not with kids. It's like, oh, my dad's here. He can't do anything. I, you know, and then I was like, I was like, what's an extremist? And then he couldn't answer. And then I was like, I just, and I just oh, like, man. I just sat there. I was like, okay, then should you not like say that if you don't know what an extremist is? It's just like, mm. uh, but like, yeah, just, like you said, you have to decide, right? Whether, yeah, hey, is yeah. it worth it or is it not worth it? And, like, and there's so many ways to just analyze what you just said, where you, where you said, well, my dad was there, so I wasn't afraid. It's like, what that's, the yeah. principle underneath that is, he respects your dad already. Exactly, yeah, but dad's got my back. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like, <clears throat> so, and so what I teach these guys is, well, how do you develop that yourself? How do you get respect yourself? How, is there a way to? Is there a way to act in social relationships that can get that effect? Because there's cause and effect in every situation. Is there a way you can understand that cause and effect so that you can each time produce a similar effect in a social situation. And I say, well, yes, there is a way you can. Okay. It's not going to be hundred percent absolute foolproof, but it's going to be like 90%. You can get pretty good at it. So good that you can control for a lot of different variables when you get really, 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 really good. And yeah. <clears throat> I think that, you know, it's like in many ways, these guys have been for so many years trained never to be real with people, never to be raw with people. Yeah. It's almost liberating for them to finally be able to. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I, I agree with that. Cause like in that, in that situation, no, the reason I got pissed is like, first he called something in Islam that's Orthodox extreme. And then I'm like, yeah. he's calling my dad an extremist. And I'm like, yo, don't disrespect my dad like that. I just exactly. Got, exactly. I just got, yeah. Like I just got, <clears> even <throat> though my dad always say, Oh, lead by example. You, yeah, yeah. My, you know, I'm like, yeah. no, screw that. And and there's there's a there's a totally appropriate place for that at yeah no exactly there is but I didn't know like I'm just I'm just yeah you're just like acting on you know what you're feeling you're like (laughs) yeah impulsive (laughs) you're 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 for your father yeah exactly exactly that's that's the word yeah yeah oh man we should talk about that too but anyways uh I I like yeah this this what you're saying is so true about the social anxiety that people had it's it's things that they should have developed when they were like five you know, five, 10 years old, 11 years yeah. old, social yeah. interactions, but they, they didn't develop it. So their development stunted. So now they have to develop They're, they're stunted it. chronically. And that's exactly yeah. it. It's like their parents didn't know it properly. So their parents passed on their dysfunctional parenting strategies yeah. to the kids. Exactly. Or if their parents so knew it, like, they just weren't prepared for this new culture. Or, yeah, and, and, or and you just spend way too much time online. <clears throat> it's, 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 when parents truly understand it, a consequence of knowing it, a consequence of having that training is that you will take the, the, the necessary steps and measures to, to train your child, whether it's dealing with their internet use, whether it's dealing with the fact that you have a tough job schedule, right? Mm-hmm. You, will do, you will find a way. So it's like a lot of the parents, it depended on their level of training. If the better their level was, usually the better the kid's outcome is. And obviously there are certain factors you just can't control no matter how hard you try because we, we yeah. can't solve, we can't, we can't account for all variables in, in the environment. Like for example, I train my child, but then he goes outside into a really screwed up society. How is he interacting with that society and how is that society interacting with him? That is something that you can't necessarily control fully. So it's like you have to rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, tie your camel, give him the best training you can or her yeah. and then hope that bismillah, it's going to work out. Some prophets, like I, I believe Nuh alayhi salam, his own yeah. child went astray. His wife yeah, went exactly. astray too. Yeah, Allah's right? the one that guides at the end of the day. You do your best, but, right? I mean, he was a prophet and his son was, was misguided. So. But the thing is, how do you make your best better? <clears throat> can, you, can you repeat that, Amar? Because you when you were speaking, oh. I couldn't hear. Oh, cut out. Yeah, so uh, the, like Nuh alayhi salam's son, he was a prophet, very righteous man. His son, like he wasn't, he wasn't guided, right? Allah's the one that yeah. guides at the end of the day. Yeah. You got to do yeah. your best though. But you got to do your best, it. right? So it's like the idea here is that by doing this, you're maximizing good outcomes and you're minimizing uh, exactly. bad outcomes. Yeah. In psychology, there's risk factors and protective factors. So it's like these, doing all this would serve as a protective factor and it would minimize risk factors. But at the end of the day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala determines the outcome. Exactly. Um, and so <clears throat> through these structured sessions, these guys are learning these things. They're also re- recognizing what the extensions of these principles are. So if I teach them the principle of order, 
order is attractive. Therefore, we, we, we are attracted to beauty, s- symmetry in a face, in a body. Mm-hmm. But there's order of character too. And we are driven by necessity. Just being good looking isn't going to meet people's needs for order. You also need to be a man who can behave in a way that's functional so that you can bring other people to, to an orderly state. That, that's going to mean meeting their needs, whether it's getting them security, shelter, knowing how to open them up when they have emotional problems, setting them straight through discipline if they're acting out of line chronically and it's because they've been spoiled, um, showing them more empathy if they've been treated too harshly for too long. That's, that's you enacting order because of, because of the order in yourself. And so it's like they'll learn, okay, so then I should focus more on developing sound character for good relationship outcomes and less on obsessing over getting a nice fade, you know, perfect lineup where like, you know, instead of wearing like the top of the line designer clothing, like a bunch of emasculated metrosexuals and <laughs> some, some critics, <clears throat> when they characterize us again, they will say the completely opposite thing of what we're doing. They'll straw man us. They'll accuse us of doing the opposite of what we're doing. They'll be saying, Oh, these guys are focused on shallow things. And I'm like, well, I just, well, even that, even you had any, if you spent five interest. minutes. Yeah. It's in your well, best interest to look good. Like, what? <clears throat> like it's, it's to your favor like you go for a job what one of you is obese and the other one's fit you're just subconsciously <laughs> <rude. Right? laughs> having a phys- because, fit physique is a yeah. sign of robust genes like it's it is connected. it is but like, what i'm getting at is even deeper than that i'm getting at critics not understanding that i'm not just telling them that being physically orderly or fit is enough i'm telling them that you need to you need to take care of your physical fitness to to whatever degree is necessary and yeah. then Focus on the other things that are necessary. Internal. Like you need the inner game. Intellect. Okay, so so fitness. Sound judgments. Not not actually obsessing over your body to the to the degree where it becomes far from orderly, it becomes disorderly. Mm-hmm. Rich Piana, the five percenter culture, you know, it's like yeah. Yeah. taking roids and, and trend databall, deco. What the hell? Right? It's like Yeah. How do you know all that, Amar? Say, say that again? You know, like all those, all those specific steroids, like Diana Ball, Trembolone, yeah, yeah. Ball, you know, <clears> like, <throat> exactly. Those are, those are some, you know, it's not like I Google them or anything like that. It's not like <laughs> I go on steroid forums and think Damn, about Damn, man, this guy knows steroids. his stuff, man. He knows his stuff. <laughs> May Allah increase your knowledge. I mean, I mean, <laughs> uh, oh yeah, it's uh, like, he, yeah, yeah. So it's like, uh, we're, we're, we're trying to teach these, what I'm trying to teach these, these brothers is to understand their priorities correctly. What are, what yeah. are the order of, what is the order of importance of uh, maintaining order in your life? Your, yeah. Whether it's between your physical appearance, through your ability to have good expression, yeah. communicate clearly, all these things, right? Yeah. So it's like they're learning to be balanced, well-rounded men who can meet the needs of other people properly. They can take care of themselves. They're responsible. Their reasons for taking care of their bodies has everything to do with the correct reasons, the correct nia. Not yes. for stupid dysfunctional reasons like, oh, yeah. I want to become a bodybuilder who through my body, I become the strongest man alive and I'll get all the respect in the world. That person doesn't understand that you can get respect just fine without being Arnold Schwarzenegger. You're wasting your time. You have a delusional perspective on how relationships work. And, mm-hmm. and so therefore, you're wasting your efforts. Your nia is not correct. Even if, even if you get some benefits of the outcome, there's a better way to be than that. So, Definitely. I try teaching these to these guys in the same way that I'm, t- I'm talking to you guys where we talk about ideas and concepts and they're like, yo, that makes sense. Yeah. And we'll, we'll even have like debates where they have to, they have to tell me what, they, what they're truly thinking and I will correct them on the spot and I will tell them focus on being congruent, focus on telling me your thought because I'm training you to be committed. Let me handle the correcting correction part instead mm-hmm. of trying to correct your own thought before you say it to me so that you, you tell me what you think I want. Just tell me your raw thought. I will correct you. Let me handle that. And so they'll start to learn to be genuine and, and they'll start to learn to start showing emotion on their face. Body, their body language will improve. They won't be like hunched over. We're supposed to work out because it's part of the sunnah. So the yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because I'm like, sense. that's not what you really believe though. That's the answer you know is right, but that's not I what mean, you really body, believe. Yeah. Exactly. So like, okay, Susie, she's in my, my, uh, 
my marketing class and man, she's so fine. I want to talk to her, but I feel like I'm, I'm too weak. I don't have big enough biceps. I want to talk to her, but if I get big, if I get jacked, you know, she might notice me. I'm like, that's what you read. That's just your real reason. And he's like, I know, but I can't say that. Cause then I'm like, <laughs> you think you will ever be <clears throat> able to embody Islam when you're trapping your true condition like that. And they're like, mm -hmm. no, I'm like, this is private. You can tell me. I'm not telling you to go to the public and hold a microphone up and be like, Salaam Alaikum, public service announcement. I want to smash Susie. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, no, he's just saying, I want to give her that one. Cover story. Come on. <laughs> Rookie move. <laughs> Start DMing her. <laughs> Start DMing her and all that. You know, it's like. I'm um, like, if you, the better your social skills get, you start to realize how much you can actually say, even in public, and people won't, people will just, they, they've just been primed to understand it and not get triggered mm -hmm. because you've, 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 you've created order in the, in that interaction. Yeah. You set the frame. Say again? Right. You set the frame. It's like when I meet someone, yes. I'll like, yes. I'll, I'll, I'll like talk crap about like, <clears throat> I'll, I'll, for example, I'll, I'll say something about like polygamy or something. Right. I've set the <clears throat> frame. So now when I make outrageous jokes like that, it's normal to them. Yeah. <laughs> and so like, and no, I do this on purpose because I don't want to talk to you if you and I don't see the world the same way. Mm. True. Right? That's true. Yeah. So, yeah. so it's kind of like, I set the frame. Yeah. That, it, the, and the thing is we subconsciously do that anyways. Right? Yeah, we do. When you we meet that, someone, yeah. you try to, when you try to find common ground, what are you doing? You're setting the frame. Setting the frame. I was like, do, are we yeah. compatible? What's going to happen? Do we see the world the same way? Are you a lip tart or not? I don't know. <laughs> right? Yeah. And, and, and I'll, I'll, I want to bring critics. Uh, like, you know, finish your one, thought. One, thing, one thing I want to mention before we go yeah. there is I, I do teach them how, how they can actually um, build bridges too while yeah. being authentic. I say, look, it, it is possible. It is possible to build bridges with people where you're, you're going to have friction. And sometimes uh, friction is not just sometimes, but quite often, in fact, friction is inevitable if you have integrity. You have to learn yeah. to deal with it. It's, it's like that saying that before things get better, they have to get worse. It's like when, mm -hmm. when a situation, a person, a relationship is already so dysfunctional, oftentimes to, to, to save it, to rescue it, and to fix it, you have to, you have to remedy it, and that's going to take on an ugly form sometimes. Perfect example is if you're training a guy who's already – you have the correct position to train him. You're his coach. He's obese. He's, he's extremely irritable. You're telling him to do his push-ups. He's going to throw a tantrum sometimes. But the end result is, if you stick it out, is that he's going to get better and healthier and happier. So sometimes the, those initial stages of frustration and those initial, that initial clash is necessary. That's where frame control actually matters. Expectation matters. Expectation management matters. Are you able to work through those clashes and have the stronger frame so that you can push this person towards order? And then you're able to reinforce their, their new good behavior. Now that they've accepted your frame, because ideally your frame here is, is better. It's, it's good for you. It's good for them. It's good for your relationship. And so, so I, teach, I try to teach them, how do you talk to someone you disagree with fundamentally? How do you give them enough positive incentive to even, even care mm -hmm. about changing? Cause I'm not just telling you to go in and criticize them and be like, you're stupid. Ha <laughs> ha. You're dumb or you're fatty or you're ugly. <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm teaching you how to show them that you will, and you are willing to invest in them. Mm -hmm. That's going to sometimes take good cop and bad cop mode. Yep. It's a full program. You're not just telling them what not to do. You're prepared to take them by the hand and show them what to do. Therefore, they're going to listen to you. Be like, okay, fine. This guy actually cares. All right, yeah. man. Oh, yeah. And shows you're authentic. You know who that reminds me of? Hmm. Gordon who? Ramsay. Gordon Ramsay? Uh, he's a bad cop, man. What are you talking about? Huh? He's full bad cop. What do you mean? Isn't he like full, like... Is good cop to bad cop ratio is like. <clears throat> okay, I used to think that, but when I started yeah. watching his his uh, Hell's Kitchen series, I yeah. started seeing. Wait a second, he's actually he he actually has a pretty uh, empathetic side when he when he tries restore you know he tries first diagnosing the problem in a team behind the scenes like they're a dysfunctional gr crew they can't manage the restaurant if their lives dependent mm -hmm. on it. He diagnoses the problem, then he gets on he gets his his his. Uh, a bad cop mode on, you know, set, you know, setting them straight, setting them into order. And then when they break down or cry or, or they show a more vulnerable side, they're not being arrogant. He'll show them like support, encouragement. Finally, they listen to him. They do the job right. They get the great result. And then he's like, yes, you did it. High five. 
and then they, they, they feel like, wow, Gordon, you really coached us through this. So it's like, if men understood that they can do that too in their relationships with women, yeah. that, yeah. and if women receive that, the whole package, they wouldn't have this caricature of manhood as, as just, ha, ah, you're stupid, slap, you know? It's like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And like, I, I've never met a man who actually does that, by the way. I've never met one. And I deal with a lot of dysfunctional guys. I have met guys who, who act violently and aggressively, but it's never just that one dimensional. Yeah. No, definitely. Yeah. I, I wanted to ask about the, the average age of your clients. Around. Um, <clears throat> so I have, I have different, uh, different groups, cohort, cohort groups. And I also have different client groups. So the cohort, sorry, cohort, cohort groups, they were, they were the ones I was getting data from when I was running my programs for free. I would teach them uh, fundamentals of working out in a functional way, getting their posture right, maintaining healthy nutrition throughout the week, getting their their primary lifts in, being pain-free, okay? Then I would teach them some of the character stuff, how to maintain a frame, understanding the ABCs of social mechanics. Uh, manhood 101, uh, womanhood 101, and then boom, boxing and wrestling workshops. Now they're in, in movement. <clears throat> they're in movement. They're getting, they're getting a, a feel for their physicality. These kids would be from ages 12 up till age 18. So preteens to teenagers. Sure. And then another group would be 18 to about 30, uh, 35. So it's like young men to about older men and then another group would be uncle g (laughs) nice (laughs) uncle g um who have their own set of circumstances and problems you know it's like some of them because for them it's like what can this kid teach us you know they come in with that mentality like what can this kid teach us he's a a, he doesn't know it no he doesn't know nothing man yeah yeah. i can teach you how to stop being passive aggressive that's a starter you know, <laughs> you gotta stop, stop I can teach you how to talk to your kids properly. Oh, but how do you know that, huh? What What do you you don't have any kids yourself? Okay, we'll look at the kids that I produce through the through, through my one eighty lines. Why do they keep coming back to me? True. Why? Why don't you rep- try it yourself and tell me if it worked? And and so they'll try it, and they'll be like, for him. Thank you. And they'll, they'll bring them their kids next time, you know? So I'm like, okay, there you go. You can be skeptical. I invite that. <clears throat> Just test it out though. And then tell yeah. me, you know, yeah. am I a bad teacher? Are you a bad student? Are we both stupid? Do we both Let's find out? Or is, it, or is it just that you're not willing to try? Yeah, I, like, I like how you have skin in the game with regards to like everything that you teach. Can you, yeah, can you repeat I- that? I really appreciate the fact that you have skin in the game with regards to everything that you teach. Oh, alhamdulillah. I appreciate I mean, that's that. That's how you should teach. Yeah, for yeah. sure, man. I don't want to hear I appreciate like a your fat guy's tongue got to get fit. Yeah, yeah, for sure, man. Uh, it's true. It's true. I mean, I understand there are exceptions where it's like, oh, this person really was fit and they, they do know how to do it and they're just going oh, yeah, through some man, really tough exactly. things. But yeah. it's like most of the times, if they're incongruent constantly, you don't want to learn from them. Why? Yeah, exactly. Learn, they can't yeah. motivate you. Yeah. So Fahad has this problem because on Twitter, you'll tweet about a lot of stuff he reads, but he doesn't, he doesn't do it. So that's why it's like... <laughs> name <laughs> one. Name what? one thing, bro. <laughs> name one thing? Do you really want to go there, bro? <clears throat> <laughs> like, you're talking about financial <laughs> tips. You're talking about financial tips. It's like, bro, you're, you're, you're on your dad's money. Like, no offense, bro. I love you, bro. Like, yeah. You can't give pe- people tips on how to be rich when you're not rich. We're not there yet. For sure. I know you got the mind and stuff, but like, yeah. No, it's good, though. It's all good. It's all jokes. Uh, <clears throat> you know what you could do to optimize your approach? You could be like, you could you could make it look like you you're learning it yourself, and then you're passing it on as you're learning it. Yeah, yeah. That, that's what that's what you should do. Boom. That is what. Then I you prefer. position yourself as a congruent person. No, no, he's doing I don't that know if now. Do or not, but no, yeah. no, he's doing that now because I gave him crap for like not. Having <laughs> so it hey, it's all good. I I I was like, I mean, I went through my own phase of like not being congruent. I'm still working on it, right? All the time. I put up that status. I think you you saw it recently, where I'm like, I'm yeah. A I mean, we all are, right? We all are. Islam gives us our 12, our 12 uh, steps. You know, it's like, exactly. yeah. we're all in this stage of, or we're, we're all in, on somewhere on the spectrum of hypocrisy. 
and we're trying to mm-hmm. improve. Right. Yeah. So, so, yeah. I want to talk about your <clears throat> critics. Uh, so like, yeah, people will give you, I, 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 I want to mention that. Wait, how, Fahim has critics? No, but no, I'm saying like, <laughs> in general, like he's talking about the critics of uh, the way people, like how we think and all oh, masculinity. Oh, you guys are just, uh, oh, this is all non-Islamic concepts, blah, blah, blah. Right. And mm-hmm. what I want to mention is uh, the Scandinavian countries, right? Like where women have more jobs, like the job markets are super equal. They still pick yeah. jobs that are more flexible, more family oriented. It shows their traits, higher in agreeableness. Right. It shows yeah. that. Yeah. So that even <coughs> Allah, like Allah knows us men and women the, the, in the best manner, right? He knows how we are, how we should operate. Knows so us better than we know ourselves. Yeah, mm-hmm. he knows us better than we know ourselves, exactly. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Like, instead of fighting that, we should, you know, accept that, accept those things instead of trying to mm-hmm. question, like, question our faith. I think, I think most of your critics, Fahim, they've probably, they've internalized a postmodern liberal world Progressive. view. Progressive. Progressive is the word Hakiki yeah. to use. And yeah. he drilled it into us, bro. <clears throat> a lot of them, I mean, there, there are two broad camps. Okay, so one camp is liberal progressive within a sort of capitalist framework. And another camp is vehemently anti-capitalist. Um, they, they have a heavy investment in decolonial studies, uh, critical theory. And, and f- out of critical theory came uh, postmodernism, right? Yeah. So, they they will they will criticize the Western order, without simultaneously recognizing their own biases how how it has affected them. They're borrowing, or they've been impacted by, the very state, and civilization that they are telling us not to not to fall for. Don't fall for their definition of masculinity. Don't fall for their their concept of patriarchy. And I think to myself, do you think that the West has a monopoly on manhood and masculinity? Because if you think that you, my friend, are the one who is colonized, I never said that. I exactly, never said that exactly. The West has the only concept of masculinity. You said that. You assume it because you're skeptical of me automatically, thinking that it must have come from the West. These are the same people who hate when the West takes ownership and, and makes claim, lays claim over all the achievements in the world. They're like, oh, the West thinks it's so great that it's the height of technological progress that is at the height of, you know, civilizational uh, development, political order, social order. So why would you therefore think that it's the only civilization that has produced any meaningful concept of masculinity? One, and you might say, well, we don't think that. But then why do you think that we, we have adopted it? And number three, this is especially problematic. This is the clash between analytic philosophy and continental philosophy. And, and, and a lot of and the continental philosophy uh, is intertwined with a lot of the the uh, critical theory, postmodernism, structuralism, post-structuralism, where essentially, instead of <clears throat> like the, the analytical philosopher will focus on, does the concept make sense? Yes or no? Is it true? Yes or no? The, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the person invested in say, a more continental philosophical approach influenced by decolonial studies, he's going to be thinking or she's going to be thinking, what's the baggage attached to this idea? Is it coming from a white supremacist background? Is it coming from a capitalist background? Hmm. Yeah. Jordan Peterson, he's, he's just fodder for all these outriders. Even, though, even if some of the things he says sound nice, we can't take from him because the, the origin of this word he used or this concept, it's, if you go back 300 years, it was these Enlightenment philosophers. And they, they believe in things that aren't part of Islam. And therefore, well, well, Jordan Peterson yeah. can't be accepted. I'm like, what the hell are you saying? Like, well, those same people, they'll <laughs> criticize the Islamic scientists too or the Islamic Christians too. <laughs> You know, I'm like, how, how do you even, how do you know that Jordan Peterson has this agenda? How do you know that all this baggage destroys the actual veracity of his concept, that it, that it renders it unsound? How do you know he even means it in the same way? How do you know that people today are interpreting it the same way? How do you know that it doesn't have cor- uh, correlations or correspondence with Islamic yeah, versions of exactly. the exact same yeah. reality, right? That's the key right there. Are we, are we saying that only Muslims have access to universal truths? Okay, then, then why do we accept science? We can't accept science anymore because science is also being done in a Western capitalist system. So we have to, we have to just, if you, if you accept testosterone is real, you're taking from the kufar now. <laughs> <laughs> if you accept that cancer is real, oh, wait, this, you think this cure works? 
this, this treatment works on cancer? Don't you know that the scientists who determined this were positive, uh, what, what is it called? Uh, logical positivists. They, didn't, they, they, they don't believe in the aqidah of Islam. And I'm like, they're not even consistent in that regard. <clears throat> they will take from many aspects of Western civilization and cap, you know, even, even things that came out of capitalism. And, and then they'll criticize us when we <clears throat> find parallels between universal truths that people here recognize and that we find in our own tradition. Yes. By any means, accept it from the same aqidah. And for them to yeah. assume that we do is, a, is them having a bad opinion of us, not giving us the benefit of the doubt without even talking to us. You know, I've had people, <clears throat> I, 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 I know this one brother, I actually called him on the phone and we had a, a more heart to heart conversation because on the phone, people are a whole different, whole different beast or a whole different puppy <laughs> behind, behind the screen. <clears throat> and this guy was making all kinds of insinuations um, like, oh, this cult of masculinity is really um, Muslims reading Western right winged ideas into Islam and their prophet is Jordan Peterson far before their prophet is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I'm like, what? Did you just insinuate kufr upon an entire, entire undefined group of people? Did you just insinuate kufr? Like, is that what you're doing? Do you even know who Jordan Peterson is, what he believes? Do you even know how we interpret what he says? Yeah, that's right. You know, it's like, <clears throat> it's, it's ridiculous. These are some of the people I've interacted with. Yeah. They're not just anybody's. The same they're, people they're, attack us, and then they'll, yeah. like, give a blind eye to, like, freaking feminists. We have blind eye to, like, women, like, leading men in Salah. <clears throat> and all this yeah. deviant stuff so, where they start yeah. critiquing scholars, like, and not even legitimate criticism. <clears throat> right? they, they, they throw in, like, critical, like, these left-wing liberal things. You know how, like, uh, liberal uh, progressives critique Christianity? It's like the same yeah. thing with Islam. They yeah. do the same yeah. thing with Islam. Absolutely. They, Absolutely, yeah. They are more sympathetic. They have their biases. Even if they say, we don't accept feminism, we don't accept these things, they are definitely more sympathetic to it. They will definitely take it, its existence more seriously. They'll try, to, they'll try to study it accurately. Why does it exist? They'll make excuses for sisters to flock to it, even if the consequences yeah. are worse. Yeah. And... <clears throat> All even regard, even while disregarding the fact that brothers doing this, uh, this this circulating or this this um, what would be the right word, circumambulating around the manosphere is a very recent phenomenon. It's happened what within the past few years. Probably ten of us, bro. Let's be real. Right, a minority <laughs> yeah, at that tiny yeah. tiny minority. They don't even know what we believe. First of all, there are only ten of us, honestly, bro. Minority. They're more threatened by that than years of progressive conditioning, liberal progressive conditioning. Some of it, even, some of it is even worse. It's Marxist conditioning. Okay. Yeah. It's straight up like, yeah, they're pro communism. <clears throat> so it's like, yeah, go ahead. And I'm like, just because you critique the West and capitalism, are you saying you're closer to Islam? Like maybe I agree with your critique of something, but what you, you first of all, you have nothing to replace it with nothing. Mm -hmm. And secondly, even if you did, how, why would I believe that that's somehow cl any closer to my beliefs? How is that any better for me? Because uh -huh. if history has taught us anything, the Marxists hated the Muslims probably even more. Yeah. <laughs> you know? The only difference is they're not in power right now. I don't care. You don't have to be in power to spread something that you don't have to be in power uh, to believe in something that's kufr and that has eternal consequences for you. Uh -huh. Right? You yeah. could be an oppressed person and still adopt a kufr idea. And and, and, yeah, you dawah, and you rejected that dawah. What yeah. is that going to make you any any safer in the in the Akira? You know, it's like it's not. And you can you can tell that I've I've actually studied this stuff enough to understand where they're coming from, right? You can tell I'm 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 actually pointing out patterns very specifically in light of in light of uh, and trying to be accurate. For example, I made a distinction between people who are actually liberal progressives. And they don't even understand capitalism or Marxism. And I, and I made a distinction between, I, I distinguished them between, uh, or, or I distinguish, distinguish them from people who reject capitalism, who will say they reject Marxism, they want Khilafah, but they still have biases in how they treat issues. They're more sympathetic towards one side. Mm -hmm. You know, I made a distinction, I, I, I distinguished them. They would never do that for us. They would never treat us with that kind of, accuracy yeah. it would never even Definitely. be like look there's nuance there's some groups that believe this some believe that 
they're they're happy to just throw us all under one brush and be like, these yeah. guys are all testosterone exactly. induced porn view, porn viewing, you know, incel. 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 That's, that's a favorite <laughs> word nowadays. Oh, they're called the villain incel. The guy's like married with like four kids. <clears throat> yeah, Hermakullah. Bro, and like they call single unmarried Muslim men incel. <clears throat> <laughs> but like, <laughs> I, I just sneezed, and instead of saying Alhamdulillah, I'm like, Yeah, Alhamdulillah. 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 And I'm like, no, Alhamdulillah. never mind. You guys are supposed to say that now. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that was a sneeze. It sounded like a cough. <clears throat> it was some kind of weird hybrid, bro. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, but like, yeah. Like, uh, you know, by, by the way, like, um, Fahim isn't just uh, an armchair, I guess. Was it an armchair expert on these topics? Like, he actually dabbles seriously into these topics right so what would you say your interests are um <clears throat> alhamdulillah currently so I'm, st- I'm i'm pursuing clinical psychology and counseling psychology at the master's level sure. i'm also studying uh um biomechanics for 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 fitness and sports from a sports science perspective and to to sort of augment my myself as a coach and then on the other hand Purely for da'wah purposes, <clears throat> I'm studying the analytic philosophy of religion, I'm studying political philosophy, and I'm studying aspects of continental philosophy, okay? I, I, have, a minor, I have a minor in philosophy for my undergrad, and uh, I had the opportunity to study philosophy at the master's level at various institutions, but <clears throat> for, for my career, I decided to prioritize clinical psychology for now, and I'm going to revisit philosophy later on down the line um, sure. yeah 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 so I'm, I'm trying to study all this stuff so that i can actually intelligently I- interact with these concepts and, and part-time I'm, I'm, I'm seriously trying to pursue ilm but i've been a very terrible a very terrible student may allah forgive me um i'm trying to i'm trying to work on that i have teachers alhamdulillah and they keep me they keep me grounded in the tradition alhamdulillah uh, <clears throat> and then you also did uh, boxing right Growing up, and I'm. Uh, I, I boxed for about 13 years. Yeah, and I wrestled four years high school. Yes. I did Brazilian <laughs> jiu-jitsu for about three years, and I'm gonna get back into Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Um, I want to. I really want to go further in it. Yeah. So, yeah. Alhamdulillah. So do you, do you do MMA at all? <clears throat> I do. Yeah, I do. I I think that I still need to work on my submission grappling, but my striking, Alhamdulillah. I'm very comfortable with that. And my wrestling is getting there. It's, it's pretty good right now, alhamdulillah. I just need to work on handling submissions. So we'll, I'll, for, <clears throat> excuse me, for some of the Rajala retreats, we'll have like all these brothers who fight have club. different backgrounds. You guys have a fight club then? Yeah. <laughs> Muay Thai, no! wrestling. We had this sheikh. He's an awesome sheikh, man. He's, he's doing his um, degree in psychology and I think philosophy of religion now. But he finished his full seven years Darsi Nizami program from, from a madrasa, traditional madrasa. And he's married, has a kid. He comes over sometimes. We do Muay Thai. The guy's a beast. Afterwards, he does, he does a halakha for us. So it's like nice. solid. We'll have Pashtun brothers, two of them. Yeah. Amar knows both of them. Shout out to Muhammad Ali and my brother Omar Ali, um, yeah. both of whom are beasts. You know, they're amazing dudes. Yeah. One is a, one is a, yeah, they're smart. One, the, the older brother Muhammad, he's a, a crown prosecutor in Canada. Yeah. Like that's a yeah, high, 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 high level, <laughs> you know. And his younger brother Omar, he's a, a physician. And these guys are uh, giving hal- like <clears throat> mashallah, they develop themselves professionally. Um, yeah. They fight like they're physical, so obviously they must be fit. And then <clears throat> they, uh, they give halakat as well, right? So. Mm-hmm. They've developed themselves professionally, spiritually, and physically as well. And that's kind of, that's kind of this um, goal that you have with your Focus 180. That, that's absolutely correct, yes. Because different sports, like when I, I, earlier in our interview, I mentioned that when I was 19, when I didn't, know, when I didn't have a curriculum developed for guys, yeah. my first step was to just get them into movement. And the reason why is because modernity and in a post-industrial society, Jobs have changed, lifestyles have changed, and guys, because they're not moving anymore, they're out of touch with their own bodies. So you know how Amar, you mentioned neuroticism. I noticed yeah. that one of the problem, one of the one of the greatest 
ways that that, that, that neuroticism is sort of uh, worsened, one of the ways it's worsened is by having a sedentary lifestyle. You're not moving. You're, not, you're completely out of touch with your body. You're stuck in your head, anxiety ridden, yeah. floating around in this abstract world. You know, when you're finally in your body, you're grounded, your anxiety is experienced completely differently. Oftentimes it's grounded too. And you finally uh, are able to interact with your space. You're, you, you learn to express your body language in ways that are conducive to your fitra. Example number one, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he didn't walk with a hunchback posture. We, we read from the sirah, the, sh- the shamail, um, describing him that his posture was so perfectly aligned. And we, we, I remember something from Sheikh Hamza Yusuf where he mentioned that when his kids were young, he allowed them to play outside in, in nature while they were naked, like two or three. And it's like <clears throat> when men lose touch with their, their, their natural selves, I'm not saying go run naked. <laughs> <Dear me>. but, <laughs> <laughs> it's dark outside. No one would see though. <laughs> The only thing is rather cold. So. Oh, the only exception is if you have so much hair, like Pashtuns yeah. might, that no one could tell. <laughs> you're yeah. just covered in hair. <laughs> but uh, um, <clears throat> if you're disconnected from your body, then that is one of the biggest barriers in the way of you developing your uh, your, your your sense of your sense of self, your sense of congruence, mm-hmm. one one integrated identity. You know. If you're a fragmented, you're a fragmented set of anxieties, you know? So it's like, not, not, sorry, not anxiety. You're a fragmented set of identities that experience themselves anxiously, you know? Mm-hmm. You have multiple yeah. faces. So it's like, <clears throat> I thought to myself, what's the easiest way? What's the easiest way to get guys started? I, I can't just wait till I know everything. I'm like, okay, let me just get them moving. Yep. Boom. That's it. Yeah. I have a pretty specific question for you. <clears throat> sure. How does, what is the difference between mindset or sorry, what is the difference between fitness and MMA in your training and how does that impact your client's mindset? Okay. Very good question. Fitness, 180 fitness is a pretty broad term to encapsulate multiple programs. Some of them could be functional bodybuilding, just, just getting a little bit more muscular while still being able to move efficiently, pain-free. Um, some of them might be incre- improving your posture, <clears throat> corrective exercises to uh, uh, account for injuries you might have had, or powerlifting, strength training, okay? So this will help a guy stay grounded, and it will help a, it will help a man um, sort of develop his presence, okay? Mm-hmm. 180 MMA will teach him how to actually fight and defend himself. It will teach him how to actually perform movements like kicking and punching and dodging, bobbing and weaving and slipping, um, pulling guard, you know, uh, maintaining the correct posture in, in wrestling when you're standing in your upright, you know, when you're, when you're, so not when you're upright, when you're on your feet so that he can actually defend himself, develop his balance. And also he can navigate, he can navigate in the real three, three dimensional space around him while working with another brother, his entire body, that takes that that works on your nerves in, in remarkable ways. How so? Think of it as wrestling with your own nerves. You know, can, you, you're 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 having to work under pressure. You're having to work uh, under anger. You're having to work uh, under feelings of embarrassment sometimes. Like, oh, I'm losing. You have to work under feelings of humility, and and you you have to do it all the while ensuring you don't destroy your partner. For sure. Right? There's that there's that tension of beating him versus humiliating him you know it's like there's always that tension and then there's also mm. main, learning so that requires balancing your emotions how do how do you how do you do such an intense thing while being in a balanced state that takes tremendous internal training but while you're doing external movements i think the sufis call that internal stillness while engaged in external movement and then they'll talk about things like external stillness while maintaining internal movement you, you might look like you're meditating, but internally there's a lot of, en- there's a lot of energy flowing through you. A lot of different emotions being processed, right? <clears throat> so fighting helps you with that. It really helps you channel all that. 
aggression as well. Street kids fighting in the streets versus in a focused, directed way, mm-hmm. learning a new skill. Boom. Learning discipline, learning the concept of dedication and commitment, that it takes time to develop yourself. And especially when, it, when your body is in it too. Not just, you're not just laying in your bed fantasizing. You got skin in the game. You're feeling your heart beat. You're feeling your muscles get fatigued, filled with blood. That affects you. Inevitably, that's going to affect your perception of someone else and your perception of yourself. Will, will you respect the work it takes now? Will you be less arrogant? Will you be more confident? Mm-hmm. Will you be able to handle yourself under pressure in real life more easily? Right? Yeah. What do you what <clears throat> say are the behavioral differences between guys who just stay in the gym versus guys who not only stay in the gym, but get on the mats as well? I find that the beha- some of the behavioral differences are, and this is by no means Absolutely. scientific, you know, sure. like, yeah, it's not, it's not, it's not a scientifically sound assessment. You know, I, I don't have statistics. I don't have any, any uh, s- systematic studies, but from my own anecdotal experience and my own abstractions, what I think and what I see are that guys, <coughs> guys who, who can actually fight, they tend to be, um, more calm. They tend they tend to be more measured. Yeah, they tend to be more measured, but they they also have they they also have the sense of authentic, authentic grounded confidence. Mm-hmm. Such that if you push put pressure on them, they won't back they won't back down or shrink. They also won't yeah. be like Ugh! they don't need to front. There's no fronting involved whatsoever mm-hmm. because they know what they can do. Yeah, that's right. Right. It's like they know. They, they're, they're, they're well prepared. So it's like, whoa, this guy, okay. It's like, this guy's not fake. He's really, damn, he's not bluffing, man. You, yeah. you can sense that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yo, you know, what, by the, the way, one thing I wanted to mention is yeah. I say this to my critics often. Some of them criticize testosterone. And I'm like, you guys, you guys get triggered when some of us mention how guys have too much estrogen. We're doing, we kind of, we just do that as like a shorthand mock, you know? Sure. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, you guys are no different. You guys will criticize testosterone, except you are different in the sense you'll do it in ways that are fallacious. When we do it, we actually, we're actually making a point that's true, that too much estrogen in a guy is bad. It's yeah. actually bad. Whereas when you do it, you don't even make sense because you're making fun of this very hormone that not only do you depend on, your wife depends on it, your kids definitely depended on it to exist. You know? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and that the absence of which causes more problems than it solves. You get you're more irritable. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Not to even mention another point. A woman's sex drive actually depends, or a woman's yeah, a woman's sex drive actually depends on testosterone and not estrogen. Interestingly, yes, enough. yeah, that's so true. It's, it makes sense. We are the we we must provoke their libido, right? Mm-hmm. Through our, our our more proactive nature, our more our more proactive sexual nature. Okay. Um, <clears throat> another point I want to mention is some of some of these people are so caught up in this the you know dichotomy of oppressor and oppressed, and I'm like. Okay. Why can't we be friends? <laughs> I'm like, who are you going to send out to defend the oppressed Muslims? Y- who? A bunch of soy boys? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> who are you going to send out? <laughs> Done. Show me, show me your us. army. You know? <laughs> it's no, like, if, if anything, it's probably just like <clears throat> policemen and uh, courts. If anything. Say, say that again. If anything, it's probably just going to be policemen and courts. Mm. You know, straight up. Straight and those up. policemen are going to be really masculine males as well. You know, I like, to, it. I like to have this analogy of uh, velocity, right? Mm. So velocity, it has a scalar component <clears throat> and a directional component, right? It has a magnitude and a direction. So like the magnitude is like the speed, right? So that's how masculine an individual is, right? And then the, the direction is their morality. Does that make sense? Yeah, oh, yeah, I see what you're saying. It's too high IQ for the masses. Wow. I like that. I like that framework, though, uh, yeah. because it goes to show that there's a dimension that is measured purely on the basis of, of masculinity, and there's a dimension that is measured on the basis of uh, morality. That yeah. is an interesting uh, dichotomy. because It actually came <clears> from <throat> Jack Donovan. I just need to make sure I, I quote his idea. Okay, Jack Donovan. It's interesting because <clears throat> I think that sometimes, sometimes 
what in Islam, for for instance, what is what is explicitly a masculine role overlaps with what is a fard, which would be in the domain of morality. For example, uh, for you to be a wali is a, is a masculine role. It's a yes. role assigned to men, right? Yep. And it also has to do with the issue of halal and haram. Is it har- are you doing something haram or halal? Is it is it halal for you to, for example, um, disregard your duties as a wali? Answer is no. Yeah. So that has to do with morality. So in that case, you have something that's masculine that is also related to morality. And I, and so I think that <clears throat> it would be very useful to develop some kind of a framework, you know, like a visual one that people can look at and be like, oh, that's really interesting. I know Imam al-Ghazali, alayhi rahma and another thinker by the name of al ragib something 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 i can't remember who imam al ghazali took a lot of his social ethics from they had a lot of these frameworks um for example on character development and i'd be i'd be very intrigued to pull them out and see how we can sort of you know create like a like a, a modern day friendly version that mm-hmm. understood by the, the 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 21st century average dude for sure. Yeah. What, <clears throat> what, what role does uh, goat slaughtering have in your program? Say again? What role does goat slaughtering have in <laughs> Right now? Not as of now, but perhaps in the future. Because think about it. How to Zabiha. <laughs> goat slaughtering. So American you mean Zabiha, slaughtering. yeah. Slaughtering the greatest of all time. <laughs> no, because look, goat slaughtering. Okay, this is zabiha is an action that man has done since the beginning of time, <clears throat> and we've well, lost that quality, like taking life with our own hands. What are you talking about, bro? I did it last week. What? <laughs> I did it did last it? week. What are you talking about, bro? You did it last week. No. Last week. Last week. Yeah, I never did it. I'll be Why? honest with you. Why did you do it? This is actually, that's a very interesting question because one of my uh, groups, the youngsters, the 180 Lions, the coming yeah. of age group from uh, 12 to 18 that are based out of a city nearby. A lot of them are from the, the local Bengali community there. Yeah. Their fathers get together they, and they drive up to a local farm and they hand slaughter their meat and then they buy it and they bring it back. And they've, they've kept their, their kids in that tradition. So when I saw that, and a lot of people in my extended family likewise are involved in permaculture, organic gardening. I, I made a connection that just like <clears throat> for men, it's important, and even women, but especially for men in this context, important to get physical, you know, channel their energy, learn to move and to respect the boundaries of their, their space. Likewise, it's important that they in- interact with the physical soil around them right and, sure. the, and the animals that they're eating it's a very similar uh, it's a there's a very similar principle working there and i think that principle boils down to when you are connected to reality you learn what the limits are what the laws that govern it are and your behavior will will start to reflect that that understanding so and you respect you, it more yeah you, you respect it more including in how you act You'll, you'll, you'll understand what is a functional behavior fit, that's fitra oriented and what is a dysfunctional behavior that is haram, you know, sure. and, and you, your, your life will also end up being healthier. The people around you will be healthier. They'll be happier. Mm-hmm. Great example of that would be you, you have a healthier relationship with your own body. You're, you're less likely, likely to become obese. Uh, you have a healthier relationship with um, nature so you're less likely to contribute to pollution and you're more likely to be invested in, 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 self, in, in sustainable farming practices. For sure. And you respect the meat from where it comes from as well. Yeah. Like, and you respect life as well because you respect life because like, you know what it's like now to take it with your own hands. Yeah, Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I think that the, uh, the Uthmanis, the Uthmani Khilafa, I don't know if this is true. I saw a meme. This is based on this. My sources. Are, okay. <laughs> Very yeah, it must be true. <laughs> Allegedly, uh, for six months, their butchers would work as butchers. And then for another six months, 
the, the following six months, they would be sent to garden so that they would have this balance of respecting life and taking life. Jalal and Jamal, kind of. Yeah, yeah possibly. Yeah, Jalal and Jamal. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So I was like, whoa, that's, that's some intense understanding of the human psyche. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Like at one, at one point you're like destroying life Okay, in order to feed other people and to consume, and the other one you're producing life, mm-hmm. and it's not even Absolutely. like you're producing animals; you're producing flowers or you're producing yeah. corn yeah. or whatever plants. Some of the most docile, fragile creatures. Plants. Beautiful, aesthetically pleasing, and fragile. Yeah, subhanallah. Resilient, resilient, and fragile, just like women. <laughs> Mashallah. <laughs> it's true, right? They're resilient in terms of their internal anatomy. You know, giving birth. Externally, they're much more fragile than men. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Right. And then, like, also, meat is very non-aesthetic. What's it called? It's ugly. Oh yeah. Cutting things is oh, ugly. So much. It's brutal. Yeah. This Why is, you doing it for it's such a Why very you? beautiful. No, that's a very very beautiful that's contrast. Really poetic. beautiful contrast. Subhanallah. You could write an essay on that. You could. You really you could. could write it for her. Yeah, I'll write it, a tweet bro. on it or something. <laughs> Do a whole podcast on it. <laughs> Yeah, you could, honestly. Economy of meat and the flower. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, what's your opinions on like weapons training for young men? I should take this off. <laughs> the camel. <laughs> yeah, bro, what the hell? <laughs> of course, God <clears throat> takes it there. Of course. Yes. Disclaimer, we are law-abiding citizens. Hey, I love America. <laughs> Yeah. I don't screw fight the power stick it to the man All right. He's so, in Canada. it's okay guys <clears throat> basically I think that men should always be capable of defending themselves within the, the limits of the law yes. um, assuming the law is reasonable and it actually Pro Second Amendment. do functional things like protect your own life and your family's yes. life right yeah exactly. um, and, and, and in the US <clears throat> I think Muslim men should definitely uh within the, the limits of the law of course invest of course. In, know, in knowing how to protect themselves in in understanding their rights in having a working relationship with law enforcement not not a docile weak relationship or an alienated relationship but a working relationship because there's two extremes one is becoming a bunch of soy boys who allow um uh informants to, to infiltrate them and and screw them or screw them over and treat them like trash like they're suspicious criminals and the other extreme is um, to be completely alienated from them, not even to have dialogue. So <clears throat> they should have a working relationship. And I definitely believe that because if we don't have that in place, that kind, that kind of a model, we will be destroyed, right? We'll be destroyed. Eventually, the capacity for us to be destroyed will manifest itself. And so it's like, this is exactly why even in the U.S., Th- those kinds of rights existed in the right. constitution, right? Yeah. It's like that, that whole principle exists that, well, if you don't have the potency to put power into check, you know, and, 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 and uh, hold it accountable, if you don't have that potency, what happens when it gets corrupt to the point of trying to take your life for no good reason? For sure. Yeah. See ya. <laughs> yeah. Yo, regarding your mission, right? In one sentence, what would you say that is after that whole long, um, it's like so far it's, it's been what, like two and a half hours. hours? Yeah, two and a half hours. What would you say your mission is after all that? If you can put it in a sentence. My mission is to optimize men, particularly Muslim men, but I'm open to all kinds of men. I even have programs for women and girls. Mashallah. And your brand, the way it relates to this mission is that it's, it's an embodiment of it. It's an embodiment of it. Mind, body, spirit. Spirit. Yep. Yeah. Nice. And then, okay. So I know that you kind of had spiritual struggles or not spiritual struggles. You had struggles growing up. Right. And it's kind of as a result of growing through these struggles that you found motivation somehow to, create focus 180 correct yeah okay so but why do you feel alhamdulillah 
what, why do you feel the need to contribute back in this particular field? <coughs> when you say this particular field, what do you mean? What I mean, I mean like your focus on men and your focus on Muslim men. Why do you feel the need to contribute in this manner to them? I think he answered this, right? Yeah. I think it's because well, it's, you, you don't want people to go through what you went through. You want the math. You're making them I, I don't want, exactly I don't want people to go through what I went through and also the more socially competent you become you realize you're not a social island right the ripples of your decisions will affect others and the ripples of others decisions will affect you individualism is a lie we have we are interdependent our environment shapes us and we shape our environment so you the more competent you become as a man inevitably means you become more proactive and by consequence you are going to influence more people in good ways right for sure we're going to and so it's just a matter of where what what scope do you want to focus on is it going to be your own family is it going to be your your community is it going to be larger than that mm -hmm. i just simply decided that it's i want to be responsible for helping a larger number of people because i feel that i'm positioned to do so and i feel that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has opened the doors for me to do so by giving me the the experiences that i've i've had i've had and the knowledge that I, I've, I've, I've obtained. And finally, the mentors that he's connected me with. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. And why the name? Focus 180. Focus 180, yeah. Why? Why this name? <clears throat> Does it so, just sound cool? <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of funny because it used to be called Focused Intensity. And my friend back in the days who helped me with it came up with Focused Intensity. He's like, you know what guys are lacking today? I'm like what he's like they're lacking focused intensity i'm like focused intensity yeah that's true they're always they're just stuck in their bedrooms but it was it was copyrighted so we're like oh man we got to change this up and i spent like two hours in a, in a in a in a room dorm room with my another friend and we're like thinking like focus he's like do you want to keep the focus part man i'm like yeah it has to be in it because that's what i struggled with myself growing up focus yeah spreading myself thin and not growing this way vertically all right. Like fine. What about focus? I'm like 360, full circle. And he's like, they're gonna they're gonna finish where they started. Then what's the point of that? I'm like, oh, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, okay, then then what? He's like 180. I'm like, yes, redirection. Okay. Focus. Nice. Yeah, that makes sense. <clears throat> pretty pretty creative. Also, yeah. say that again. That's pretty creative. I was going to say, like, oh, yeah, because yeah. I was wondering, like, why 180? But that yeah, yeah. makes sense. Yeah, yeah, so yeah for like, sure. For sure. Yeah, same circle. I think we, I thought that we covered most questions. We have one question from a fan. Sure. Okay. Uh, Mohammed is his Twitter as at mango underscore sheikh 786. He's 5.2.0. <laughs> what? He's like another five. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Mango. <laughs> Okay, so Mango Sheikh, he says, <clears throat> how has your study of Dean influenced slash, slash informed your study of clinical psychology, philosophy, and your other areas of study? <coughs> it's shaped, it's, my study of Dean has shaped my study of everything else because my study of Islam has set my, the, the, the lens through which I interpret the world around me. Yeah, I'll give you boundaries. an example. Yeah, the boundaries. I'm a Muslim. My aqidah is rooted in, in Islam. Um, we have creedal books of sort. We have we have books of creed that establish clearly what our creed is. So if I'm studying clinical psychology and I want to research something that is taboo amongst academics in North America, I will very often still study it if the reason it's taboo amongst them is for biases they hold as as uh, materialists, they don't believe in the soul, right? right? They don't believe in the Aqidah, I believe what we have a soul, or they might, they might only believe we're just a composition of physical parts. So me studying Islam is the very reason why I'm able to interpret data differently from others. It's also why uh, I, I, I will ensure that how I sift through the political baggage that gets thrown into science you know feminist science yeah yeah There's outright science that get like erased yeah differences get erased real data is 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 wiped under the or, or or hidden under the rug i will ensure that islam guides me 
in, in interacting with that, those data points and, and being right. honest about them, right? So Islam has set my, my, my framework altogether, you know? Yeah. If I understand that some scientific point is really furthering an ideology that's not actually scientific, it's just it's an actual ideology, and it's, it, it's one that conflicts with Islam, then I'll be like, I don't need to accept this. This isn't science. This yeah. isn't hard data. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> like your, your paradigm is the Islamic paradigm. And Absolutely. Anything, and what, 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 what Islam affirms you take, what Islam doesn't affirm you, you leave. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. That's how it should be. That's how yeah, it should be. yeah. Even if it seems scientific, because we know science, yeah. especially if, if, if the nature of that science is um, a, a recent change, a recent deviation from past patterns, um, mm-hmm. we know that science is always growing. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's always, it's, it's like a, it's, it's a limited understanding of the universe. It's, it's what we know today. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Right. So if it, that, that's a perfect example. If it contradicts it's, it's, Islam clearly, yeah. I, I will always prioritize Islam. Right. And it's Evolution. only a model of reality that our minds, it's only a model of reality that our minds create of the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> I think it's our best bet in terms of studying the world around us. For sure. Yeah. But it's limited. But like, it's like exactly, exactly. Like Islam, like like you, like we both agreed on. Islam, if Islam affirms it, we take it. If it doesn't, we leave it. Mm-hmm. For sure. And, yeah, I think uh, I think now's a good time to stop. I think we went what two and a half hours. Uh, <clears throat> is there anything else you want to say, Fahim? Um, <laughs> yeah, let's talk about. You want to talk a little bit about red pill? And okay, what is the red pill then? <laughs> oh come on, bro. No, that, that's that's a whole other discussion. But we could. Can we touch on it? Ooh. Red pill would require a whole other podcast. <laughs> that's yeah, that's true. We we're gonna need a whole new podcast for that. That's, but yeah, I just want to. Like, should we keep them in? Uh, well, should we first, keep you them? said the red pill. That, that that whole term is gonna take like <laughs> so many years I, I, to describe. I, I do want to. I do want to say. I do want to say for all the male listeners and viewers that. When you learn to be, when, when you go through the training that I'm offering, the goal is for you to actually get real world results. Like uh, your women folk will respect you more. Your wife will, will be more attracted to you. You'll be able to do, you'll, you'll be able to do better with other brothers, you know, in terms of forming bonds that are deep, intimate and authentic. You'll be able to handle haters, you know, more efficiently. You'll be able to uh, set boundaries so that abusers and evil people can't harm you or your family as easily, right? I get, I get a lot of sisters who DM me or who message me on Facebook or on Messenger or on Muzmatch who will <laughs> affirm all this. <laughs> Why are right? You right. Or what? Yeah, yeah. Or my girls, or my girls uh, before, um, you know, they themselves testified. They, they testified. All of this, you know, all of this that has been testified by, by them, whether, whether uh, um, we're talking in the context of marriage or in the context, of, uh, in, in the context of the sisters I was getting to know for marriage, they all affirmed, you know, that yeah. they haven't met men who understand these concepts or they feel safe and secure or they respect the leadership that I'm showing. Um, and I'm thinking to myself that this is not supposed to be a supremely rare thing. Yeah, it should not be boring rare because of the time we live in like it's always gonna you know some men are always gonna be better at it than others but there's supposed to be a basic threshold that every man who gets training can meet yeah the one that's sufficient and necessary and today people don't get that training guys don't get that training so uh, the reason i'm making this point is so that other guys understand that i have data actual real world real real world data that includes from sisters who they don't understand the mechanics of it. Like, for example, I'm not going to tell them, here's what, what frame control means. And then expectation management. This is a functional expectation. This yeah. is a dysfunctional expectation. I won't usually go into too much depth with them unless they really ask for it. But all women can sense the, 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 the outcome, right? Because that's yeah. what they're receiving. What's the yeah, problem? I mean, even, yeah. even and it's up to men to actually teach men the process. Yeah. <clears throat> so, alhamdulillah... Um, if any guys are in need of coaching, feel free to get in touch. Um, I'm accepting new clients and where can they reach you? We can work out a schedule. We can work at your own pace. 
I have teachers as well who you may be interested to talk to. They are, they are grounded in the tradition. These are teachers who are classically trained in the Islamic sciences, far more than half the, our critics, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah. Fahim, where can, where can they reach you if someone wants to, you know, <clears throat> who was interested in being a client or just learning more? Just turn on the Focus 180 Batman signal and I'll be there. No, I'm kidding. Allah. <laughs> you can reach me through my Instagram, Mr. Dot Focus 180. 180 is the actual number. Um, or my Facebook page. You just look up Focus 180. And soon my website will be launched, inshallah. Um, I just re- I, I launched my new brand of boxing gloves and hand wraps recently. So I'll be using those to hold Rujala retreats and workshops for brothers um, where they're going to do boxing, you know, training, boom, boom, boom. And then we'll have actual workshops. We're not going to go into too much depth on all the concepts, but we're, we're just going to get them to start thinking about masculinity and their role as men. So these are the ways they can contact me. Um, additionally, once my website is up, I'll have a new email address associated with it and they can email me there. Sweet. Sweet. Awesome. All right, then. I think Jazak uh, al for coming on. We know you're busy. My yeah, pleasure. We appreciate it. And we end all of our um, <clears throat> with, as Muslims do, with Surah Al Asr. Bismillah rahman rahim Wait, should I end it right now? Or have rahim. Anything more to say before we end? No, it's all good. Cool. Bismillah rahman rahim Wal Asr. Inna al insana lafi khusr. Illa al ladina amanu wa amilu salihati wa tawasu bil haqqi wa tawasu bil sabr. Thank you so much for coming on the show. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on. Uh, it was a real pleasure. And I, I want to say that what you guys are doing is fantastic. I love it. It's, like it's it. beautiful to know, man. Because it's it can be a lonely world out there when you do this work. So it's like I realized far from going against the grain of you know ignorant critics who are lost in their own inconsistencies, I would much rather invest in forming bonds with people like you guys who are doing similar work. Yeah, likewise. Likewise, man. Really kind of you to say. Alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum. Okay. Wa alaikum assalam wa